The story starts with a narrator introducing a game. He welcomes the players to the place where their dreams come true. The game is known as the Dream Side. It is currently the No. 1 trending game in terms of its popularity online and among online users. The most popular game in everything can also be called the National Game, which everyone has at least tried out once, including idols, actors, and even politicians. Regardless of who they are, the game is played by people of all ages and demographics. A player creates a new account, and the system asks him for his name. First, he writes Kang in the given name slot, but then he erases it immediately and writes K. The system welcomes him. It directs him toward channel hash 0114, where he can make his dreams come true. K thinks that the number one rank nobody dares to surpass is his dream to achieve and make it a reality. And after trying hard and keeping going, he finally achieves it. The channel closes, and he logs out of the game. A boy is sitting in a corridor thinking that today is the day of the release of Dream Side 2, but he wonders what that screen is that has appeared in front of him. The screen informs that the channel hash 0115 has been created. The system welcomes him to the earth. He is confused about what is happening. He recalls that 30 minutes ago, he completed the express delivery as always and spam clicked the username selected for the Dream Side 2 pre-order. The lift suddenly stopped after that, and he was trapped in it. The emergency button did not work, and he could not reach 911. While he was waiting anxiously, something strange happened. A screen appeared before him. He was wondering how the screen was floating in the air. It looked familiar to him. There was a button on the screen, begging him to be pressed. A gamer nerd like him could not stop himself from pressing it. As soon as he pressed the button, he received a quest. He had to escape that lift within a minute that soon would be devoured by parasites and if he failed, he would die. He was shocked to find that. Suddenly, he heard a noise from behind. Turning his head back, he saw parasites spreading inside the lift. One of them sat on his forehead, and he got scared. Somehow, he came out of the lift before the time ended. As he completed the quest, he was rewarded with a rugged longsword. He looked back at the lift doors and saw no cockroaches coming out of there. He wondered if that was the portal that came out during the game's releases. While sitting there, he tries to understand what is happening and what the quest screen is. He wonders if this is a withdrawal effect from being unable to play games. He again hears a sound coming from behind. A goblin appears from the portal out of the blue and hits him with his wooden hammer. He falls to the ground on his face. He lifts his face, saying it hurts so much, and wonders if this is real. He gets a warning that his health has decreased due to being hit by the goblin. He stands up thinking that he needs to leave this place immediately, but he does not know how. He wonders what if he gets hit again while trying to run away. He has less than half of his HP left. If he gets hit once, he will die. He looks at the goblin, who is snorting. He gets scared again, thinking he will die here. But when he focuses, he finds that the goblin is small despite its grand entrance. But when is distracted by its appearance, he is again attacked by the wooden hammer. Luckily, he dodges the attack. When he looks at the damage that Hammer caused, he says that if one hits that, it will end him. He does not have time to think during a situation like this, so he starts running away from the scene. He runs towards the stairs thinking he can use them, but when he reaches there, he finds the way is blocked. The system tells him that he is in the tutorial and this area is restricted. He panics to find that there is no way to run. Meanwhile, the goblin throws the hammer towards him from his back. He sits down to escape the hit. The hammer jerk slammed into the wall. The boy is still in a panic state, believing he will die. In the very next moment, another screen appears in front of him. It tells him that his account has been linked. It also delivers the server shutdown reward. The reward greatly exceeds his level and makes some adjustments in him. He wonders how his body is so calm suddenly. He ponders if this is a skill but wonders how to acquire it as he has not touched anything. When he is busy thinking about his situation, the goblin grabs his hammer back. The boy looks at him. He is not afraid of him now, and his mind works calmly. He knows that this mob is a miscellaneous mob from an F-ranking dungeon. He would have ignored it if this was a dream side game. It means the chance of him losing is zero. The goblin rushes towards him to attack again. He gets ready after seeing the goblin coming. He realizes that he has the upper hand from the beginning. As the goblin jumps, the boy straightens the sword and kills the goblin by stabbing him. He lifts him, and the goblin's body disappears. 
With that, he sees more portals opening in the air. He, who was thinking that the task had ended, is stunned to see that it is not over yet. He thinks there would be at least five more if this is like the game. The question is if he can do this, but then he decides he must do it. With that, he attacks them and butchers them in no time. The system informs him that he has eliminated all the monsters on the 13th floor and earned the title Mean Slaughterer. The Hammer Goblins despise him. He has obtained shabby rags. He realizes that this is an actual game. Although today is the official release date, he wonders if this is augmented reality. Besides that, why is he so calm? Then he recalls that notification from back then. He asks the system to show his stats to check whether this game is real. He finds it nice that he does not have to type the commands. The system shows everything about him. His name is Kang Siajun and he is 29 years old. His original skill is the heavenly body. It says that the player's level is low. Therefore, the heavenly body has been restricted and only a part of it can be used. The only activated skill is calmness. Siajun wonders why he has the skill he earned by grinding for a month and if it could be the server shutdown reward. Siajun remembers that Dreamside used to be extremely popular. The reason why this game failed was because of its extreme difficulty. The player had to type in each command every time they cast a spell. In the end, there were a lot of new users who quit the game as they were unable to adjust to the game's mechanics. But the main reason why it was called a shit game was because of something else. If a player died three times, their character was deleted. That is why there were barely any advanced players. There were huge disparities between the rankers as well. The top 12 rankers were deemed inhuman. Among the users, they were considered god tire users. They were also known as the ones above the heavens. The number one ranked among everybody was Kang Siajun. But the game server shut down after five years, and a poll was hosted on their homepage. The players were asked if they wished to bring over any item to Dreamside 2. They were given three choices. It was called the server shutdown reward. Just like that, the server of the first dream side was shut down. But Siajun did not expect to receive the server shutdown reward like this. Siajun grabs his head in disappointment, thinking he should have selected a mythic item if he had known it would be like this. But he brought back the three most important things. Siajun clicks to check his skills, but it is locked. He is informed that he is adapted to combat and can only use his skill partially. The related skills have been restricted and they will auto-activate once the criteria have been met. He wonders what it means by partially activated. He says that it is no wonder using the sword felt natural. Most importantly, he felt something he had not felt before while playing the game. It was his controlled mind. Now he knows what that calm attribute from the heavenly body was. It means he would still receive the other two as a reward, but he could not use them since they are late game items. He decides to consider them later as he cannot use them anyway. He hears noises from the other floors and wonders if it is another monster. The system informs him about the dungeon transformation. It says that a parasite has appeared in Unit 103 of IFOG. The dungeon, the corrupted tree of physics, will form soon. He has to escape these five six waves that will turn into a dungeon. He has only ten minutes to finish this task. His reward will be the basic survival kit, but if he fails, he will die. Siujun looks at those instructions and wonders if there is no break time. The system warns him that the boss of this tutorial is appearing soon. It is a residential building in a normal day. Suddenly the floors of the building shake. A girl leaving her home felt the shaking and wondered if it was her imagination or reality. She inhales and ignores as she is leaving already. Out of the blue, a hammer goblin appears there. She is stunned to see it. It is happening in the other parts of the building as well. The goblins are causing terror. People start running away to save their lives. Siajun hears those sounds and wonders if it has already started. He looks at the timer. He has 10 minutes, and the countdown has started. The situation looks bad. He thinks if it is the same as the game, more hammer goblins, just like the one now, will be summoned and so many people will die. He panics while imagining the situation. He knows dungeonization is a phenomenon where a normal area becomes parasitized and monsters swarm. This process was the core concept of Dreamside. However, if this building is dungeonized, fighting against the hammer goblins would be impossible for those who are not players. He ponders what he should do. Then he realizes he has cleared the mob on level 13, and the mobs on the other floor are not coming here. That means the mobs cannot leave their floors. 
If he escapes the building in 10 minutes, he clears the quest. To do so, he needs to make it to the roof. While going upstairs, he hears the screams of people asking for help. As he reaches the upper floor, he finds dead bodies and blood everywhere. He thinks that this building is already a part of the sequence to be dungeonized, and he can just go to the next building by going to the roof, but he does not know what will happen to the people left there. Then he thinks of an idea. He says it is the one method only K, the top ranker, can use. It is the best method to save everyone. He decides that he should not escape the building. He has to raid the dungeon. While sitting on those stairs, he is certain that, even in the tutorial, this dungeon boss hates light and is set to inhabit the basement floor. That means the boss is there. But he needs to find a way to get there in 10 minutes. He looks behind and finds a portal through which the goblin came to this floor earlier. He wonders if that is the only way. He goes near the portal and says this portal was created because the parasitization was stopped. He believes it should be okay to travel through it. He uses the calmness skill to relax his mind and enters the portal. As he reaches the other side, the system informs him that he has discovered nature's infected hidden seed room. He looks around and sees that he is in the basement parking lot. He is glad because his assumption is right. He says it is season 2 of the game, so he thought it would be a little different. But the game becoming a reality is different in itself. The goblins are walking everywhere, and one goblin almost catches Siyajun there. But he hides behind a wall in time and saves himself. He peeks at them from there and finds they use those portals to go up. He thinks that if he wants to save other people, he has to close those portals. To do that, he needs to kill the boss. He looks around and finds the boss monster in a corner. He is looking at it in real life for the first time and says it is huge. He even doubts if it is a goblin. Instead of a goblin, it looks similar to the Hulk that comes out in movies. He has to get rid of it anyway before the dungeon is and progresses. He looks around and notices that this place is still not a dungeon. He says that in the tutorial before dungeonization finishes, there is a different raid tactic for this situation. He looks at the screen to find how much time he has left. To execute his plan he needs time. But he has only 2 minutes and 17 seconds left. The time keeps passing. Now only 1 minute is left. It is time to start action. He knows that when it is one minute, the mobs will have shortness of breath. It is the right time to launch the attack. As these are the last moments before dungeonization, all monsters have shortness of breath. The boss also stops its movements. He remembers that in the past, there were a lot of people who played using this moment. Many people wanted to level up. Earlier, he was unsure if this applied to this situation, but now he says there are no exceptions. First, he needs to misdirect the smaller mobs. For that he finds a good place. He runs and jumps on that car. The small goblins look at him, but they are confused about what to do. Siyajun knew that would happen. Earlier he used his title, Coward Slaughter, to raise the rage of the goblins. Due to the rage, the goblins' situational judgment has become weaker. Now in the remaining time he has to kill the boss as he is not moving for a few more seconds. But unexpectedly, the boss starts moving and attacks him. He dodges that surprise attack and wonders if his shortness of breath has finished. Then he notices his nose bleeding and deducts that the big guy is moving by force. He thinks he must finish it quickly before the boss monster moves more. He jumps on him and with a slash of his sword, he beheads the big monster. The weather forecaster, So Yuhyun, from the Good Morning Show, greets everyone on the radio. He reads today's forecast. He says that for most of the nation, it looks cloudy and the concentration of fine dust is bad. In metropolitan areas, there are high winds and a thick fog through the morning. Due to today's high concentration of fine duet, people must avoid going outside. He wishes all of them good health. This morning should have been the same as any other morning. However, it is different. An incident around 6 a.m. started in Seoul, the center of Korea, and then took over the whole country instantly. The internet was blowing up because of that incident. Everyone was denying this, but they started to believe the media. Those citizens unconvinced till the end were in half doubt about this situation. In a dressing room, a celebrity asks her makeup artist if she has seen the news this morning. She says yes and replies that most people think all those videos are CGI. The girl replies that they have not seen it for themselves. That's the only way they could say that. Suddenly, she realizes that the videos look like the scenes of the dream side game. The celebrity is a famous idol, Choi Hana. 
She is looking at a live stream where the streamer shows the lizard monsters holding spears. He says that those monsters suddenly came out from the sky. While he is busy streaming, a monster rushes towards him and kills him as well. Hana is shocked to see the dungeonization happening in the real world. Her makeup artist asks her not to move. Choi Hana is the country's best female singer and songwriter. She is also called the country's idol. She is an all-rounded celebrity in commercials, dramas, and movies. However, for Choi Hana, who has a cute and innocent persona, she has just one secret. When she gets her makeover, her manager tells her their schedule has been cancelled today. They are returning to the dorm, so she should prepare quickly. Ignoring what he is saying, she shows him the videos on the internet about what's happening. Appa asks her when she got back her phone. He says that she is not allowed to use it. The president will scold her for this. But then he looks closely at the screen and asks if it is a movie. She tells him that it is a live stream. She says it is being streamed from Namsen Tower and the monster is called the Red Wyvern. She adds that the situation is bad as the dream side has become real. Appa snatches her phone and says she should not start this dream side addiction again. She tells him she is serious and asks him to return her phone. Choi Hana's only secret is that she was a dream side player. There's a term, heaven above the heavens, used for some players. This term means there is a sky beyond the sky. In the past, 12 people were beyond the heavens that all players looked up to. Among them, the best player who used guns unrestrictedly was rank 12 magic bullet runner Clark. Playing the side game was a hobby that even Hana's fans did not know. In case Choi Hana got caught when playing the game, she used a voice changer. She even picked a middle-aged male character. That's why no one in the country thought Clark was the country's top idol Choi Hana. But since the game has become a reality, there is no need to hide it anymore. Appa is placing her phone inside his jacket's inner pocket. Hana tells him they do not have time to waste and asks him to return her phone. He recipes he will hand it over to the president and she can take it from him. She is furious and thinks she will get screwed over because of this strict manager. She says that the world has flipped upside down and asks why her phone is getting confiscated. Appa says that she might end up going to rehab. He would not do it because of her reputation, but he would have no choice if she kept doing this. Hana remembers that if she links her phone with her account, she might be able to use items and skills like in the game. She requests Appa to listen to her. Suddenly, the earth shakes and they fall to the ground. She looks at his hand holding her phone, hurriedly takes it and runs away. He tries to stop her. She tells him to stay there and not move. She will go and confirm the situation for him. Then she tries to link to her account. As soon as she logs in, a screen appears asking her if she will equip the reward for registering the magic revolver. She says of course. The next moment, the revolver appears in her hands and she is surprised to have it. She loves holding that revolver in real. She still wonders if it is a dream or if she can shoot this. Appa sees a portal opening behind Hana's back and warns her. A ghoul is coming out of that portal. She excitedly looks at it and says it looks more gross in real life. She tells Appa to watch this and learn. Appa gets that her gaming nerd has Akon. She points the gun at the ghoul and says she will kill this weakling in a single shot. But as she pulls the trigger, she becomes stunned to see that the gun does not fire. She asks the system why the gun is not firing and if it is a fake. The system tells her to wait as the synchronization is in the process. She asks if it is kidding her. Suddenly, the ghoul jumps to attack her. She keeps dodging her attacks as she has no way to fight back. Finally, the synchronization completes. She looked at the monster and said he was dead now. Now she fires at the ghoul and the bullet makes a hole in its body and leaves it from the other side. The ghoul is dead. Appa is still shocked. He asks Hana what is happening. She looks at him and asks why he is still here. She tells him to run and hide somewhere safe. She had somewhere she needed to stop by, so he was on his own now. He asks where she is going. She replies she has to go to the person who knows all the attacks for this game. She is going to meet Kay. Meanwhile, in the basement parking lot, Siajun is standing near the corpse of the boss monster. He looks at the screen, where he is informed that the infected nature's tree has failed to dungeonize. He has successfully defeated the F-rank boss monster, Infected Nature. Siajun sees that the corpse of the monster is disappearing. He notices that the monster is disappearing, but the damaged buildings and the blood is still there. He does not think this place will be raided for a while. 
another portal appears on the scene. The system says it's another tutorial quest where he has to face the labyrinth of choice. Siyajun remembers that one needs to clear each trial in each difficulty, and it is the last stage of the tutorial where one gets rewarded with a skill. Siyajun says that it has not ended since he stopped the dungeonization. Instead, it is the start. He smiles and says he is ready to start the tutorial. Siyajun enters the portal. He looks around and realizes that this place is real. It is the tutorial map from Dreamside. He can smell his surroundings. Some gates start appearing at his back. These four gates are ranked from easy to hell difficult. This is the labyrinth of choice. It is the last step of the tutorial where the player is rewarded with a skill depending on their chosen level. Even if it is the same skill, clearing the easy difficulty will get him an F-ranked skill, whereas clearing the hell difficulty will get him an A-ranked skill. He ponders and says that normally, he would choose the hell difficulty. But the problem right now is the hell level tutorial is designed so that it cannot be cleared. It was not fixed even after the users complained it was a difficulty setting error. The public viewed the hell difficulty as an unattainable goal. But one single player managed to clear the hell of difficulty. It was Siyajun. But he remembers he died a lot too and sacrificed all his accounts to clear that stage. In addition to that, the circumstances are different this time around as well. He looks at the status board and finds many players have already entered the gates. Though the number of players entering the hell difficulty is comparatively low, they are unexpectedly higher for Siyajun. He is surprised to find that. The number of players is still increasing. He thinks that the fact that this many people are attempting the tutorial must mean that this phenomenon must be happening throughout a significantly large area, at least the whole of Korea. He wonders if it could be the whole world. He closes his eyes and recalls all those dead faces he saw. He wishes for no more people to die. But before that, he has to be worried about himself. He looks at the hell gate and says in the end, he will still choose this. With that, he enters the portal. As he enters, he finds a screen informing him about the stage and the task. It is the stage one of the hell. His task is to protect the statue of the goddess from the golems for a set time within a restricted space. He has only five minutes for that, and if he fails, he will die. He thinks that this time restriction only exists in hell difficulty. He cannot back out from this anymore. As the timer starts, those stone golems launch a group attack on him. Even though they are made of stones, Siyajun can easily slash them with his sword. The start is not as hard as he expected. He wonders if it is so easy because of the heavenly body's skill. But the problem starts after that. The golem's eyes color changes to red. The system warns him that the oxygen in the dome is depleting as the monsters become more active. The reaction time of Siyajun will be decreased by 0.5 seconds. In addition, the monster's speed and power have increased by 5%. Still, four minutes remain to end this stage. This is the problem in the hell difficulty. In proportion to the remaining time, the player's movements get slower and the monsters get faster. This is a stage where he has to predict and move ahead of the monster's movements. As half the time ends, the true terror of hell difficulty begins. He wonders if there is a reason to bear such a high risk in the tutorial. The golems are faster and more accurate in attacking now. But there is a reason to take this risk. He has succeeded in a hidden mission. It was to dodge everything for the three minutes in Hell Difficulty. Such missions only exist in the Hell Difficulty. But as he has succeeded in this hidden mission, a hidden stage has opened, so he has to clear in the remaining two minutes. All the golems start merging and make a huge stone golem. He roars right after its creation. Siyajun covers his ear, saying its voice is noisy. He is excited because in this hidden mission, he can get a stat reward that does not exist in other difficulties. The boss golem tries to crush Siyajun, but he jumps and escapes from its reach. He swings his sword at him, but this one is so rigid that it breaks his sword. The golem gets no harm. While running away, Siyajun thinks he can only get his tutorial reward once this stage ends. He opens his inventory to check if he has something to fight with. There he finds something useful. He unequips his rugged longsword and equips a corrupted hammer of physical damage. He calls the golem to come at him again as he is ready to take him on this time. The golem rushes toward him. He still has one and a half minutes left. Golem throws a punch. Siyajun tackles it with his hammer. Both forces collide, and as a result, golem's fingers break by the hit of the hammer. Siyajun is glad to see that his plan is working. The golem throws another hit using his second hand. 
The attack was sudden, but he dodged it as well. Siujun throws a hit on its arm and crushes it too. The golem screams in anger. Siujun looks at the golem and thinks it is a tutorial mob, so he should be able to take it down just by cutting down its HP, but still, its weakness should be its fusion core located at its stomach. The problem is that it is too high up. He thinks it differs from the game and cannot jump that high. He looks at his legs and thinks of a plan. When the golem tries to crush him using his foot, Siujun dodges it and throws a critical hit on its leg. That single hit breaks its leg. The golem stumbles and falls to the ground on his back. Siujun jumps to make his final move. He hits the fusion core of the golem and breaks it into pieces. The golem dies on the spot. With that, the shield starts disappearing. He sighs that it's finally over. He still has 37 seconds left. The system congratulates him on clearing stage 1 of the tutorial. He is glad because he has got some time to spare due to this hammer. The system informs him about the rewards he has earned. He also has a hidden reward of a rank strength. Certain elements of the original skill, Heavenly Body, have also been activated. The skill, Dragon Eye, also has been unlocked. The last reward brings water to his mouth and shines into his eyes. He says that was the reason he cleared the Hell difficulty. But this was only the first stage. There are still way more tutorials to be cleared. He remembers it took him a month to clear the tutorial, even in the real dream side game. Sia Jun keeps moving forward in the tutorial. It's night, and he is in a jungle, clearing this stage by killing those monsters. He laughs because this is too easy for him, and he enjoys it. He can see the monsters even if they are hiding. He loves his dragon eye skill. He loves smurfing. Suddenly, he notices a dagger that has been shot at him. The dagger gets stuck in the tree trunk. He looks at it, laughing and asks where she thinks she is creeping about. He tells her not to think he will miss her. His dragon eyes allow him to see the flow of mana. He is talking to the aura of darkness that is flying behind him. He tells her to show herself. She shows herself in her true physical form. Her name is Naden. She tells him that he is foolish to wake her up. She says he could have lived if he had just moved on and pretended he had not seen it. She tells him that his arrogance has brought his life to an end. If he wished to die, she should fulfill his wish. But when she looked down, she did not find him at the place he was standing before. While she is wondering where he has gone, he appears behind her and cuts her into two halves using his sword. She falls to the ground. She does not move, but she tells him that if this were her true body, he would already be dead. She has not lost yet. He laughs and says if she thinks he would be the same as he was at the beginning of the tutorial, she would be in trouble. Her body disappears and her dark aura flies back. He tells her to return to her true body and wait for him. He will be coming for her soon. Suddenly, a screen appeared and congratulated him on clearing all the tutorial stages. He again gets multiple rewards. He has been notified that he will be moved to a village in five seconds. He is glad as it is leveling time. Sia Jun walks through a portal and enters a strange place. He asks the system what the current date is. It tells him it is January 17, 2022. He is surprised that three months have passed since he entered the labyrinth of choice. He did not expect it to take this long. He decides to search for the survivors in this apartment first. He needs to figure out the current situation. Some players are gathered outside a high school in Seoul. They all are worried and sure that they will die if they just stay here. They ask the policeman, Odisu, if he has any plans. He tells them that they do not have time anymore. They have only a day left to clear this dungeon. A player grabs Disu by his shirt and asks if he is kidding them. He asks if he plans to raid an E-ranked dungeon and if this looks as easy as the game. The boy says he does not know how many lives Disu has, but the rest of them only have one, and they will die. Disu grabs his hand and says he knows all of them are afraid. He is afraid too, but they have to go there right now. The dungeon is about to enter the dungeon break stage. A dungeon break is a phenomenon where the monsters inside the dungeon multiply excessively and are expelled out of the dungeon. When the dungeon break occurs, the portal gates turn red, and the rank of the dungeon begins to rise slowly. The same thing goes for this school. The dungeon in this school has already gone through a dungeon break once, and now the level of the dungeon is about to rise to D rank. Disu thinks the problem is that the people here are the ones who could not even clear the hard difficulty, and they have only been raiding F-ranked dungeons. He tells the player there that it's over if the dungeon level rises to D-rank. 
but they will not have another chance if they do not do this now. If a dungeon break were to happen again, nobody would be able to survive it. Gong Jiwon, a salesman before, raises his hand and asks why that dungeon is growing rapidly when all the other dungeons in the area are still at F rank. Disu replies that it is because the monsters in that dungeon are undead. Those monsters are typically referred to as zombies. Those players are terrified to hear that and ask what that has to do with the E-ranked dungeon. Disu replies that it is because, unlike other mobs, getting bitten by an undead immediately contaminates a player. This is like how it is in zombie films. Furthermore, these mobs can even turn corpses into zombies. G1 is shocked to hear that. Disu keeps going and says they are at a school that has already become a dungeon once. In this boarding school, children who had done nothing wrong would have been helpless to the attack of zombies. He tells the players that they have lost many things up until now. Family, loved ones, friends, it is countless. But they have to fight to defend their home from these mobs, to protect their loved ones, and to protect themselves from this changed world. They must enter. As he raises their spirits, they all bravely enter the dungeon. He says that in this world, dungeons are like homework. It is no longer a catastrophe that destroys their lives. He knows this plan is reckless, but it must be carried out for them to survive. It is alright, even if they do not have the top ranker in this group. They have Choi Hana. In the IFA departments, Sia Jun finds a lot of dead bodies. He closes the eyes of a dead boy and says he has to look for the players that are alive. He reaches outside the school and sees a red gate. He says this is the most dangerous one. He knows that the color of the door shows the condition of the dungeon. Blue is easy and green is normal, but from red, where the number of mobs increases, it is a sign that a dungeon break will occur. When the gate completely turns black, the dungeon break occurs. The system tells him that the ruined school dungeon will go through the dungeon break in 24 hours. When he is reading this, something cracks under his foot. It is the burn it wood. He touches it and feels the firewood still warm. It means they have only entered this dungeon recently. He says it is a relief since time remains until the break. Suddenly, the system starts warning and shows that time is decreasing abruptly. This is worrisome. He knows that in the game, when the dungeon break time begins to speed up, it will pour out unexpected numbers of monsters faster and decimate the villages. He says that if this is the same as the game, he is sure that a dungeon break will occur soon and everyone will die. He also needs to figure out why it's suddenly speeding up. After entering the dungeon, he looks around and wonders if that place is an empty classroom. He recalls that the structure of the dungeon changes depending on its level. F-ranked dungeons remain the same. But E-ranked dungeons make the building's objects several times larger than humans. This phenomenon where the structures inside the dungeon grow is called expansion. He looks at the big tables and thinks a whole class can sit on one. As expected from an E-rank dungeon, it is on a whole other level from F-rank. Since his level is low, he cannot let his guard down. Suddenly, a skeleton emerges from the ground and tries to grab him. The system warns him that a cursed spirit possesses the undead skeleton. Siajin smiles and says it is just like a horror movie. He takes out his rigged longsword. The skeleton jumps to him to attack, but Siajun slashes it from the middle and throws him away. The skeleton's upper part still attacks back. He blocks it using his sword. Siajun needs to find the skeleton's core to take it down. He finds something glowing inside his neck and realizes it is its weakness. He needs to get rid of that cursed spirit inside its neck. He pushes the skeleton back and throws it to the ground. He stabs that blue spirit and breaks it. As he kills the skeleton, his level rises as well. As he takes down one, many emerge there. He says he was wondering why there was only one. The system gives him a task to surprise attack the enemies 100 times in a row, and he will get the title of the Master of Surprise Attacks. He rushes and kills those skeletons in no time. He attains the title of Master of Surprise Attacks. He smiles and says this is a real gold mine for him. He looks around and says he did not kill these mobs. They must be the aftermath of the people who entered earlier. It is a shame, but he has to take a rain check on leveling up for now. On the other side, Disu and a few players are running away from the explosions. He takes cover and wonders what is happening all of a sudden. He remembers that one hour ago, things were going smoothly. The players were working well together. Because of Hana, they did not make any big sacrifices. She was helping others and guiding them not to take things lightly. Suddenly, an explosion took place there. They did not know how that happened. 
Disu told everyone to split up so they did not get much damage. Disu looks at the situation, and it does not look good. He looks at two people wearing masks and wonders who they are. They are not mobs because there is no way mobs of that caliber would come out in an E-ranked dungeon. That means they are players who are killing other players. Disu looks at the players and thinks he needs to get out of there with the remaining people. The explosions are continuously happening. Disu tells everyone to run. They need to get out of the range of the spell. That masked man smirked and said there was no advantage to running. Disu thinks those men must be aiming for Hana, the strongest among their group. Suddenly that masked man catches Disu and asks if he can run from them. Disu takes out his spear and tries to hit that man with it, but he dodges it efficiently. That guy calls him by his name and says now there's only the two of them left. Disu is shocked and asks how he knows who he is. That guy says that he is quite disappointed. He keeps attacking Disu using his explosion ability. Disu realizes that the guy is toying with him. That masked man laughs and says Disu is scurrying like a cockroach. Disu grabs his wave rider's spear that he got as a serve closing reward. There is a level restriction to it, but its power alone makes it effective, and it must be able to damage him. He looks at him and says he seems to be a high tier player based on his skill. Disu rushes towards him, saying he won't cast the explosion on himself, however skillful he may be. That masked guy smirked and said Detective Disu is too predictable. He still casts an explosion there and throws him away. While lying down there, he wonders if he is powerless against him. That guy asks Disu if he still does not know who he is. He says he is disappointed. Disu lost his touch since he last saw him. Upon paying some attention, he recognizes that voice but cannot believe it is that guy. He recalls an incident that happened a few years ago. Some officers are arresting a murderer. The media is asking him why he murdered so many people. Disu recognizes him now. He is the infamous serial killer H. Wang Dongsu from Unit 2 of Banju PD's homicide department. Disu remembers that Dongsu murdered seven people, and Disu struggled a lot to arrest him eight years ago. He cannot believe Dongsu became a player. He wonders if that means the ones with him just now are all prison intimates. He does not know if there are any more survivors from his side. Dongsu asks him if he is hoping that someone will come to help him. He says that will not be happening. The people on his side would have already killed everyone else. He says farewell to the detective. But before he does something, someone arrives there and casts an explosion. It is Sia Jun. He wonders who that guy wearing a mask is. He also wonders if they are fighting. Dongsu asks him who he is. Disu tells that boy to run away as it is dangerous here. Dongsu smirked and said he should not have interrupted whoever he was. After that he casts an explosion at him. Disu thinks Dongsu is too strong and wonders if this is their end. But when the smoke clears they see Sia Jun standing there unharmed. He activates his dragon eye skill and sees something hidden. He summons his sword and says this will be a piece of cake compared to the labyrinth of choice. Dongsu attacks him again, saying he will not miss this time. But Sia Jun easily dodges it. He thinks that if he considers the masked man's action, he must be a serial peeker. They are also called the red players. This term refers to those who repeatedly kill other players. Dream side only provides three lives, so these people are considered very evil, and even the developers consider them to be cancerous. He also almost messed up his raid because of red players. Sia Jun looks around all those dead bodies and realizes moms did not kill these people. That masked man killed them. Dongsu is perplexed by seeing Sia Jun not getting threatened by his attacks. He tries again, saying the boy should mind his business and be on his way. If he does so, Dongsu will let him go. Sia Jun asks if he will let him go like that. Disu warns Sia Jun that the masked guy is a famous serial killer, H. Wang Dongsu. Dongsu scolds Disu in anger. Meanwhile, Sia Jun thinks he has heard about Dongsu and wonders if he escaped prison. He gets ready to attack, saying it is okay as he will not leave enemies behind. His danger detection guy alerts him of someone's presence. He jumps in the air where that invisible guy is hiding. Dongsu is shocked and wonders how he came to know about it. Sia Jun swings his sword and cuts the throat of that guy. After landing, he asks Dongsu if he knows that saying, with great power comes great responsibility. The blood is dripping from his sword. He smiles and says it is about time Dongsu takes responsibility. He also tells him mixing ignition and gas was a great idea to cast those blasts. Dongsu asks him how he figured all this out. 
Siajun switches his weapons and summons a dagger. He throws it at another hidden guy and kills him as well. He says that Dongsu added the isolation skill to increase safety. He tells Dongsu that it is his turn now. He jumps and goes near him. Dongsu gets scared and tells him to wait. Siajun asks him if he waited for the others. Dongsu uses his magic techniques and throws lightning at him. Siajun takes his dagger, crosses those hurdles, and kills him. The system notifies him that he has leveled up. Siajun says that the system has acknowledged them as a mob already. He looks at the dead body of Dongsu and thinks this man has already killed countless players, so Siajun should not feel guilty about killing him. The system rewards him with an item called Dungeon Grass. Now Siajun sees why they were in such a hurry. He says he should hurry too. He goes near Disu, who is leaning against the wall. He grabs that mask in his hand and says he is a cop and Dongsu killed his sister. He thanks Siajun for saving him. Siajun says Dongsu deserved punishment. Disu says he would like to ask Siajun for a favor. He says his teammates and Dongsu ambushed him, and they were all split up. There were at least ten of them, including Dongsu. Disu thinks that they all are criminals who have become players, he also thinks they have some kind of item. In addition to that, their goal is the marksman Clark. That person is Choi Hana, in reality. Siajin is surprised to find that. He asks to ensure that Choi Hana is the marksman Clark. Disu and Siajun are passing by the auditorium. They are carrying the dead bodies of those red players on their backs. While running, Siajun says he never would have thought the marksman would be a girl. Disu says he was surprised too. But the bigger surprise was that the marksman was Choi Hana. Surprisingly, an idol singer would be an amazing player. Clark was named Marksman of the Magic Revolver for his gun handling skill. Regarding shooting or firearms, there was nobody else on his level. Siajun still cannot believe it since Kalak and Choi Hana look so different. Disu tells Siajun that it has an effect. None of the mobs have reacted to them on their way here. Although Disu was worried at first, this is a good idea. Siajun smiles and says he was not sure it would work either. He thinks that since he cannot steal those red players' inventory, he decides to use their skills and buffs. It was a good idea since their skills and buff effects would persist 24 hours after death. After a while, they reach the gym. Suddenly, the system warns them that they have only three hours till the dungeon break occurs. Siajun says he is sure of it now. Someone is accelerating the progress of the dungeon break. He says that dungeon grass is used to accelerate the dungeon break. Although it does not sell well within the shop, it has a different use case. The method to create it is simple. One must create a flower by mixing the dungeon grass and water. But what's odd is dungeon water is an item that only drops in B rank or higher dungeons. Disu says that if that is the case, there must be someone among the people that they have faced who has been playing the game long enough to get dungeon water as a server shutdown reward. Siajun thinks that most jailbreakers in prison could not have filled the survey out when the server closed. It seems someone else is behind this. He hopes Choi Hana is safe. Conversely, Choi Hana dodges the attack during a fight. She stares at that boss monster and those red players and says they have started annoying her. The E-class boss, Death Knight Vendisi, launches a vertical strike at her. She jumps and escapes the attack. Although the Death Knight has an incredible attack stat, she thinks he is still an E-class monster with a horrible defense. And just like the name suggests, he only uses sword skills that are easy to read. She has a good matchup as a ranged damage dealer. The problem is those archers continuously shooting at her. She hides behind a wall and asks how they can shoot all those arrows at such a pretty girl. She also wonders why the Death Knight is not attacking them, and if they have an immunity item. She wants to kill all of them, but the thought that they are real humans is holding her back. There is no way she can shoot them. She is in double trouble. She is afraid and tries to control her nerves. She thinks this is not a game. This is a game, and she has no choice. First, she has to tackle the enemy in front. She clears her mind, aims for the red player, and shoots. The bullets hit him in his forehead, and he dies. The other realizes there is a reason she is in a rancor. They start shooting arrows again to kill her. The Death Knight has started attacking again. She is sure she will collapse soon. She wonders why her HP is decreasing, even when dodging every attack. Suddenly, the system alerts her that she has only three hours until the dungeon break occurs. The Death Knight's attacks are accelerating as well. She is running away, thinking it is impossible to defeat an E-class monster within three hours at her level. 
and with the dungeon break constantly accelerating, if she does not defeat it, it will evolve into a D-class monster. That means she only has one choice. She stops and looks at her revolver. She shoots the monster from the front. The Death Knight is knocked out for five seconds. She prepares to use her skill, Bun Blood. While she is preparing, the monster tries to stab her, but she steps on it and uses it as a step to jump in the air. She reaches its backside and shoots it from there. She is sure her current body will not last after using this skill. She needs to pierce it with this one shot. She is hoping for this shot to work and pull the trigger. Suddenly, Sia Jun comes to her and tells her to get away. Somehow, the monster moves and she misses her aim. She wondered what had happened and why her shot had been missed. The monster is about to stab her. She does not have enough stamina to dodge and thinks she will die like this. But a barrier appears out of nowhere. It is Sia Jun who is using this shield. He holds Choi Hana in her arms and they land safely. He asks her if she is okay. But before she says something, they notice the monster is evolving. Hana thinks it will be impossible to defeat him once he evolves from an E-class boss to a D-class boss. The Death Knight has evolved into a Demon Lord. Siajum is sure that he will need some time to adjust since he just evolved. This is their chance. Suddenly Hana tells those two that they still have a chance to escape this dungeon. She says they can see it is impossible to kill the monster. The only thing they can do is run away. She notices that the arrows have stopped. She thinks they must have run away and gone to the exit. They will try to stop them from escaping. However, it might be better to face them rather than try to defeat the boss. Suddenly she notices Sia Jun moving forward. She grabs him and asks where he is going. She does not want to hear that he will fight the monster and asks if he is crazy. She sees the sword in his hand and asks if he will fight the monster with that equipment and if he wants to die. Sia Jun says it will take some time if he uses this. She tells him that is not the problem. Sia Jun asks Disu if he can borrow his weapon. He allows him and says his weapon is meant for level 80. Sia Jun says it is fine, as his level is above that. He holds that Wave Rider's spear. He knows it is a magic spear that creates waves to increase its attack power. If it is incompatible with the user, it cannot express its true power and become sealed. Hana looks at him, awaking the magic spear, and thinks it is impossible that he is below level 80. Now that she thinks about it, he enhanced his entire body and even managed to grab her while she was still in the bun blood state. She is sure that he is a high-level player. Sia Jun smiles and says they should start. He throws a potion toward her and tells her to drink it first. Sia Jun runs towards the Demon Lord. But he swings his sword to keep Sia Jun away. Sia Jun activates the dragon's eye to find the weakest point of the monster. His weakness is the same as the skeleton's. Sia Jun creates the waves and throws them at the Demon Lord. He gets caught in those waves but uses his sword to break them. But Sia Jun realizes that the Demon Lord cannot escape this skill. He still needs time to adjust. He is still the weakest among the D-class bosses. They can kill him. Right then, Hana starts shooting fire at the monster. She asks Sia Jun who he is and how he has an A-rank potion like this. He replies that it is not important. He tells her to hurry up and get ready because the HP potion will consume her if she does not. She says she plans to do that even if he does not tell her. She jumps in the air and shoots the monster in the head. Due to this attack, the demon lord stops moving for three seconds. Sia Jun gets the perfect opportunity to attack. He activates the skill, fierce waves, and throws the spear by aiming at the monster's neck. It pieces through its neck, and he falls to the ground. The system states that they have defeated the class boss, Demon Lord Vondus. They have also cleared the Fallen School dungeon. Meanwhile, those red players are waiting for Clark to come outside the dungeon. She is the key to their plan. They cannot let her leave here alive. One of them tells his boss that he thinks Clark has likely died to the D-class monster as she is not out yet. That guy in Black Mass says that even if she is skilled, she is not a player that reached level 80. Although it is Clark, it will be difficult to defeat a D-class boss. He orders his subordinate to continue to watch and report to him. Suddenly, the system also tells them that the dungeon has been cleared and the dungeon break has been cancelled. The following dungeon will have restricted monster spawns and dungeon breaks will not occur without special events. That black masked gut cannot believe that. At the same time, his messaging device beeps. He has been notified that the Blacklist Zero has disappeared from Labyrinth of Choice. That guy tells his subordinates to retreat as K has gone missing. 
Siajun feels like someone is talking about him. Siajun returns Disu's weapon and thanks him for lending him this. Hana calls him and asks him if he is K. Siajun is about to answer with an attitude, but Disu says there is no way he can be K before he says something. He tells Hana that Siajun is impressive, but the number one ranked K has yet to escape the labyrinth of choice. That is what he was told this morning. But even if he did get out, the fact that he would escape the labyrinth of choice and come here while the dungeon break is occurring makes the chances for this possibility slim. She also thinks that the chances are too low for that to happen. The only reason she came here was to meet Kay. The regions that failed to become a dungeon, although she has heard stories of places failing to become a dungeon, it has not been exposed as to who is behind the events here. Siajun is stunned as they do not believe he is Kay. Hana is ashamed as this person saved her group, including herself, and she made a big mistake in recognizing him. She apologizes to him and says she should have thanked him first. Siajun tells her not to worry about it. He says there might be survivors, so they should search for them. Within an abandoned storage room inside the school, the survivors are hiding. Disu finds them and says he is glad many of them survived. They were worried there would not be anyone while they were looking for survivors, but it looked like they were all hiding there. The guy treating the injured apologizes and says they should have helped them. Disu says it is not their fault. The fact that they are alive is a big relief. Siajun looks at Disu, inquiring about their injuries and health. He thinks Disu is not wrong. He is glad too that those players did not fight and instead ran away to survive. They will eventually grow stronger. He says Detective Disu might have different thoughts, but he can tell that Disu will be important. One girl asks Choi Hana if she is okay. She giggles and says she made some mistakes, but she is okay. Disu tells them that he was hoping they could move to camp first. He says Siajun should come with them. While going back, Hana and Siajun are clearing the way for others. The players are amazed to see that. One of them says he is not surprised by Choi Hana, but wonders who the boy is. Diso says he will explain later. They reach the Banju Station 3. While standing at the entrance, Siajun thinks the mobs outside are all F-class monsters that have gained freedom through the dungeon break. They would hate to enter an area like this since they have lived in small areas for long periods. He says those survivors might have chosen this place by accident, but this is a great location. As they go downstairs, they find people of different ages there. Those people are glad to see Disu. The kids run towards him to greet him excitedly. Disu says he is glad they all are safe. One says they are glad he is back safe and sound. Disu goes to an elder and asks him how he has been. He replies that they are safe. He notices the gloomy look on Disu's face and cheers him up. He tells him to get some rest and that he will bring him some food. Disu tells Siajun to get some rest and that he will make sure Siajun gets some food. Siajun sits on the mattress and thinks too many things happened today. The dungeons and people have died. Although the battle was not tough, the mental strain was too much. He starts feeling tired and wants some sleep. But he forcefully keeps himself awake because he cannot let his guard down. Suddenly he recalls forgetting to check his reward for defeating the boss. He decides to check it now and opens his inventory. He finds the Vindici's Blade of Regret. It is a blade filled with regret from Vindici, who died without much retaliation. But he feels awful. He says even if he uses up all the stat points he has been saving, he is barely over level 100. He knows that in case of level restriction for equipment, the character needs the required stats to use it. That means that all his stats combined would need to be over 600. He says that the fact that the detective could use the Wave Rider despite not being level 80 means one can use it with a small penalty. While thinking this, he sees a book in the inventory as well. He summons it but cannot unlock its seal as he does not meet the requirements. He puts it back, crying as he cannot even use it since it is considered a legendary item. He remembers that in the past, he became the top one because of this book. But he is hopeful and decides to try to raise his level. After that, he summons his pet. He is glad as it's been a while since he had Gorong last time. He touches its nose and it opens his eyes to his owner's will. But he jumps out of his hands and indicates that he is hungry. He pretends that he will die of hunger. The system also informs him that Gorgon needs to be supplied with adequate nutrition. Suddenly, he smells the delicious food and starts searching for it. Siajun says he is glad that Gorong is awake, but there's only one reason why he is reacting this way. It is a dungeon. 
but then he thinks this might be something else. Gorong is now in the form of a hamster, but his original form is a dungeon-eating monster, Grigori. Siajun thinks he met Grigori around level 50 and the third server termination award. He refuses to eat anything. The only things he will eat to grow are dungeon monsters. Therefore, whenever Gorong reacts, something related to a dungeon is about to happen. The only issue is why he starts reacting when this many people are around. He tries to understand what he is reacting to. That should not be why he has never reacted to other players. He looks at the kids there and wonders if any skeletons are around. He thinks some mobs might have been freed during the dungeon break. Still, skeletons are E-class monsters. Since they lack intelligence, the chances of that are slim. That leaves only two possibilities. Something is wrong with Gorong or something else is happening there. He calls Gorong and he jumps to sit on his head. Siajun thinks that it could be a penalty. Since his sense of smell is his specialty, he could have been affected. Suddenly, he sees an ill boy inside the tent. He looks at his body closely and understands what is happening. It looks like it is the latter. Disu tells players that they have to go and kill the skeletons. They are shocked to hear that. They say it is dangerous, and the dungeon has closed as well. One suggests that if they hide, the skeletons will continue to disperse. They will be safe without taking the risk. Disu says that it is the issue. Once the skeletons start to disperse away from the area, many more people will die. He says that this may be a chance for them to level up. He tells them that the dungeon monsters are strong because of their dungeon. There, they receive a buff called the Blessing of the Dungeon. Now that they are out, they are much weaker. Currently, it is 3 p.m., which is when the sun is at its highest. When the sun is high, the undead are at their weakest. He says he will not force any of them. Their lives are at stake. The choice is theirs to make. They all decide and make two teams. One is the hunting team, who will go to kill the skeletons. The other team is the camp defense team. Siajun thinks that he cannot miss this chance to level up. In addition, there is something he needs to find. Disu says that since they have a newbie, they must introduce themselves before they head out. He starts with himself. He says he is Disu and he is a cop. He is confident with close-range combat. Siajun thinks that Disu has the most potential out of everyone else. Gong Jiwon gives the next introduction. He says he was a salesperson before. But after that, he becomes confused and ends the intro by saying he will try his best. Siajun wonders why he is introducing himself like this is a field trip. Next is Choi Hana. She says her level D79, and she is good with guns. She walks away after saying that, but all the boys are just excited to see her. Siajun thinks she does not need an introduction. She is so famous that practically everyone knows her. Also, there is always the chance that revealing more about oneself can backfire. Jang ji starts his intro. He is in a shiny armor. He says he worked at his father's company. He had a house in Gangnam and another in Siacho before this happened. He was here to buy yet another house. He even has a butler and has never used public transport. Siajun looks at his fancy armor and says he is a dream side one player. His equipment was an expensive cash item, but it proved rather lackluster. Jainag ji keeps bragging about himself. Disu laughs at his intro. He points at Siajun and says this guy is new to everyone. Others ask who he is. Siajun starts his intro, but Jang ji interrupts him. He points at him, laughing and asks if he is Kang Siajun. Siajun asks if he knows him. ji says how he could not. He tells him that Siajun was Banju High School's representative victim. Siajun also recognizes him now. He was the bully who used to beat him and make fun of his poverty at school. ji goes near him and says he recognized Siajun because of those eyes of his. Siajun tells him that ji has changed a lot. It is almost like he was reborn. ji pats his shoulder and says since they are here like this, he asks if Siajun does not remember the times he brought him snacks. Suddenly, Hana comes here and pushes his hand away, asking what he thinks he is doing. She tells him that Siajin is the reason they are alive. She asks what ji is thinking about talking to him like that. She angrily orders him to apologize to Siajun right now. The other players interrupt and say they should stop fighting and head out. They will figure out these things later. Siajun finally tells them that he is Kay. Everyone is just stunned to hear that and starts whispering about it. Hana is blushing with surprise and says her intuition was not wrong. She knew that he was Kay. Disu feels embarrassed and wonders why Siajun is so good at fighting. 
He apologizes for the misunderstanding. Hana asks him if he came out of the maze yesterday. Ji Young yells that Si Jun is lying to all of them. He says there is no way that kid can be K. But looking at his shirt, he wonders if it is an item dropped from Vandisi. He still does not want to believe that Si Jun is K. She is sure that Clark carried him. He says he needs to expose him. He asks Si Jun what his level is. Si Jun replies it is 37. Ji Young thinks he is lying and asks if he is so bored that he plays pretend. Si Jun asks what he means by that. Ji Young asks if he does not know that K is not Korean. He says if he was going to pretend, he should have done his research. Si Jun wonders when he became a foreigner. After a while, they all go outside to hunt the monsters. Siaju activates his dragon eye skill. He points out all the areas where the skeletons are hiding. After that, they all start the battle. During the fight, Ji Young tells Si Jun to get out of his way. He tells him to take a closer look. This how a pro looks like. He makes some fancy moves and kills a skeleton. He brags if Si Jun noticed the difference between them. Siajin recalls that Jang Ji Young was one of the nicer ones. He would tell him to get him snacks and then give him 50,000 won. Since he was rich, he did not know how much bread cost. It was nice since it was like having a job that paid 49,000 won every time. He smiles and says he better let him have this since Si Jun saved some money because of him. Besides, he has to deal with something more important than leveling up. Borong is consuming the skeletons to satisfy his hunger. Si Jun sits near him and wonders if he is full yet. He asks him if he smells anything tasty nearby. He smells and points in the southeast. But there are just more skeletons. Si Jun beats them to check but finds nothing suspicious. Gorong again finds some delicious food within a one meter range. He throws that skull towards Gorong in anger. The sun is about to set. Since the undead buff will return soon, the players should head back. They are happy as they level up. Disu looks at them and says this is good progress, but he looks at Siajun and wonders what he is doing. Siajun is scolding Gorong, saying if he has had this much, he should know by now. Suddenly, Gorong smells something and his eyes change. He senses a buffet nearby. Disu is telling everyone to go back and get some rest. Siajun comes to him and says that before returning, they must look in the flower shop. As they enter the shop, they experience an unbearable smell. Disu tells everyone not to breathe directly, so they all cover their nostrils. Siajun points in that direction and discovers an E-class dungeon deadly garden. They get a quest to eradicate the virus. The given condition is to eliminate the plant king that continues to spread the spore virus throughout the deadly garden. They have only 30 minutes for that. A dungeon break will occur if they fail. The system also informs him that the spore virus will cause dungeon sickness and suggests he must check the status of the NPCS in the nearby town. It says that this dungeon has already undergone an initial dungeon break, so they must be aware of the infection. Now Siajun understands what Gorong was reacting to at Banju Station. He says that the phenomenon behind the people's flushed faces and blackened fingers was this dungeon. There is a wide variety of dungeons within Dreamside. Normal dungeons are like an abandoned school inhabited by goblins and the undead. Themed dungeons are with a specific genre in mind. But the deadly garden dungeons are those where immobile botanical mobs thrive. When these dungeons undergo a dungeon break, they release spore viruses instead of mobs. Dungeon sickness caused the symptoms that the person had. Once the virus enters the human body, it becomes a deadly parasite that transforms humans into monsters. Sia Jun says that the people within Banju Station are like the game's NPCs. It had to happen to non-players without any resistance. Although it should be fine for players with E-class resistances, Sia Jun cannot let it evolve any longer. As he moves ahead to enter the dungeon, one player tells him that the sun is about to set. He says that once night comes, the mobs will grow stronger, and they will be a perfect target for them. Disu says he knows that, but the red door means they are just moments away from a dungeon break. If they let it be and allow it to turn into a D-class dungeon, everyone at Banju Station will be in danger. Si Jun says that we only found it because it was hard to find since it was such a small door. They decide to do this and enter the dungeon. They are going deeper inside the dungeon. While walking, Disu peeks at the other three and thinks this is their best lineup. He could ask for nothing more. Before entering, they decided to do a small-scale attack. They selected the best members to enter the dungeon while the remaining members returned to camp. He admits they should have been fine with Hana and Siajun, 
but this dungeon required at least four people. They selected Jiang Jiyoung for one reason. His equipment had good defense stats. Since he was at a high level, he would not die in an E-class dungeon. While Disu reflects on his decision, Ji Young interrupts and says he cannot think why he would bring a low-level faker. He says they should go back and bring someone better. Sia Jun thinks that he is sure Ji Young understands who the weakest link in the team is. He comes to Sia Jun and says he disagrees with this lineup. He tries to tap his arm, but Sia Jun pushes his hand away with a jerk and says he is not allowed to touch him. He feels it is his insult but pretends he will not touch him. Instead, he is picking that apple from the branch. He plucks it and says it is a great item that fills one's MP for them. He is about to take a bite, saying the ripper it is, the more MP it gives. Before he tastes it, Hana shoots it with her gun. She tells him to be more wary of his surroundings. While he was busy bragging about it, he was about to be caught by those spiky veins. He thanks her, who has turned her face away. Disu realizes that he has made the wrong decision by selecting Jiang. After a while, they reach the boss's room. It looks incredible. The owner of this dungeon, the boss mob, is inside this greenhouse. Its name is the Plant King. It is a type of sunflower. Because these tend to observe people as they await their deaths, skilled players call these death flowers. Disu tells them to be careful. The mobs with a king in their names tend to be stronger than others. He says they could get a flower bulb as an antidote once they defeat the Plant King. If they pound the bulb and infuse it, it becomes an antidote for dungeon sickness. They can cure the patients at Banju Station with it. That is their only hope. Disu hopes they can obtain it, so he wishes good luck to everyone. Ji Young starts bragging again and tells them to trust him. As they move forward, the smell becomes worse than before. Hana asks why it smells like a sewer in here when they are flowers. The king senses their presence and opens his eyes. Sia Jun tells everyone to get down as the king is about to attack. Due to the timely warning, all of them dodge the attack. Hana shoots a bullet at him that pierces through his petals. The king opens his mouth and countless veins emerge, crawling like snakes. Even in a time like this, Ji Young does not stop teasing Sia Jun. He tells him to get lost as he distracts him, and he will kill the king alone. But Sia Jun pulls him, and he falls to the ground. Sia Jun tells him to look underneath him. When he sees there, he finds the death flowers emerging from there. Sia Jin hurriedly stabs it and kills it. He tells Ji Young that it is common sense that there would be a lot of plants near the plant king. He suggests that Ji Young does not approach it if he does not do that. The words are useless to him, and he stubbornly says he knows that already. Sia Jun activates his dragon's eyes. He thinks that to get close to the king, they need to cross this field. However, like piranhas, the plants will come at them once they step forward. Disu says they seem to have no choice but to trust Choi Hana. Sia Jun says it will be too late this way. The monster will evolve into a D-class. He thinks that if they have Choi Hana go into a bun blood state, buff her, and increase the performance of the magic bullets, she should easily defeat it herself. Hana is already clearing the field. She tells Sia Jun that she thinks she can defeat it with more potions. She asks him if he has any more. He replies yes, she blushes with happiness and asks him to give her one. He refuses her request. She angrily asks if he does not trust her. He replies it is not the reason. He says he was unable to level up because of someone else. This is too precious to hand over. He rushes inside the field of those wild death flowers carrying his sword. Those monsters attack him simultaneously. He shows his sword skills and cuts those plants. Everyone is shocked to see his skills and wonder how he can do something like that at level 37. Disu says that there is no doubt that he is K. It is a hard pill for Ji Young to swallow. He thinks that there are two possibilities. Either his level is high, or he has an incredible broken skill. Siajin has reached the Plant King. The monster opens its mouth and attacks with its spiky veins. But Siajun does not stop and cuts the flower into two. Siajun's level has been upgraded. He has gained a flower bulb as a reward. He has also been rewarded with the Thrawn Gauntlet of Kakashi. It's the night already outside the dungeon. They have come back to the road. Hana is feeling sleepy. Disu looks at Sia Jun, who is pondering something. Sia Jun thinks that the results are better than he thought. The throne gauntlet of Kakashi that he got is made out of the plant king's body and thorns. Although it is strong, it is weak to fire. It has a skilled name Thorn. It is an ordinary gauntlet, but in times of need, its skill will allow the device on its forearm to be used as a short sword. 
It should be useful since he has no weapon restriction because of his heavenly body skill. He also has increased his level by 10 since he left the tutorial. He thinks this was bound to happen. As a level 32 player, he defeated a D and E ranked monster. So he should easily be able to defeat D class dungeons soon with the points he gathered over 90 days in the tutorial and his skill proficiency. He could easily make up the difference between him and the other players. Suddenly, he hears Ji Young talking. He looks at him and finds him still in a denial state. He looks at Sia Jun and decides not to mess with him. Suddenly, Hana tells everyone to stop. She says there are signs of battle. They go ahead carefully and find the dead bodies of people. Disu checks their pulse and finds they are already dead. It looks like something happened with the camp. They hurriedly reach the station. Diso screams and asks if there's anyone. But no one answers. Sia Jun notices footprints on the floor. He thinks it is weird. The footsteps do not head in just one direction. They keep moving back and forth. Disu is still calling the people. Sia Jun tells him that it is the dungeon sickness. He looks at him, shocked, and asks what Sia Jun means by that. He replies that there are no signs of skeletons, so it has to be the progression of the dungeon sickness. Hana says that the dungeon has already been cleared and asks how the virus continued to spread. Suddenly, they hear a voice coming from inside. The man is calling for the help. They go there and find a guy stuck under the debris. They remove those rocks from him. Disu tries to wake him up. The guy opens his eyes. Sia Jun summons a potion. But the system warns him that the target is unable to use potions. A potion of revitalization is required before. Sia Jun recognizes that threat. It is the system's death sentence. The guy's legs are already in critical condition. The nerves are ripped to shreds. Without a potion of revitalization, there is no way to save him. He gives him a paralysis potion to lessen the pain. After drinking it, the guy awakes properly. Disu asks him what happened there when they were gone. He starts telling. He says that it was so sudden. A large monster appeared at the stairs. As practiced, they prepped for outside threats. However, the problem was behind them. People started to turn into zombies and attacked. Disu and others are listening to that scared kid. He is huffing and saying that first it was Hyansu. Then Yungil fell and Minhik ran away. He took Yungil and ran. Sia Jun looks at his miserable state and thinks if only they had a healer, not only could they heal him, but they would not have to worry about the virus in the first place. However, Banju Station did not have any healers. It is pointless now. That kid keeps speaking and says everyone ran away while Yungil became a monster. This shocks Sia Jun. He could not believe it was already stage 3 of Dungeon Sickness. The first stage of Dungeon Sickness stops at the fingertips changing colors and contracting a regular cold. However, as time passes, those people become zombies and attack others, reaching the second stage. Once they fully become a monster, they have entered the third stage. Sia Jun thinks that the deadly garden has already been cleared. Yet they manage to skip two stages when the symptoms started appearing. He is sure someone is causing this. That kid stops breathing and dies. Disu stands up and tells everyone to be ready to go. Deep inside the station, a monster is growling in the dark. They go near the stairs going toward the subway. Monsters are creeping all over the place. Hana shoots one in his head and kills it. She tells Sia Jun that people who have already changed cannot be cured. Sia Jun replies he is aware of that. He looks at those who could not survive the dungeon sickness and thinks that if they are here, everyone else must have followed the railways to escape. He hopes some people manage to get out. Disu looks at those zombies climbing up and worries about killing them. But Sia Jun moves forward and kills all those on the stairs. He tells others to follow him. Disu says he does not need to worry about it now. They reach the railways. Disu tells them that it is the neighboring station Shinpum. Sia Jun says he has never heard of this one before. Disu says this is a ghost station. After the plans for Line 10 fell apart, this station was abandoned. Hana notices that the footprints there are fresh. Sia Jun says it is true, but they are not heading in the same direction. Disu says it is likely they headed for Yongdungpo Station. That is where they originally planned to go in case of emergency. He says that those monsters should be moving along these tracks. Sia Jun suddenly notices someone's presence and runs in that direction. A monster's hands approach him. He jumps and attacks it using his sword. That thing jumps back. Disu warns others and tells them to prepare. Hana asks him if it is what that dying kid was talking about. He replies yes, this is Yungli. 
Sia Jun tells them that this thing is no longer Yungli. This is another monster they have to deal with. If they kill her, they can get experience and items. Disu is stunned to hear that. Sia Jun tells him that it is what dungeon sickness does. It infects people and causes them to turn into monsters. Because of that, thousands of people died within Dream Side 1. However, this time, the fate of the world depends on it. He tells her that he will surely end things for her swiftly. He needs to end it in one strike. Young Lee rushes to attack him. Sia Jun kicks her to push her back, but it is in vain. He says that she is sturdy. The arm around covering her body is acting as a shield. She elongates her arms to grab him, but he swings his sword and cuts her arms. She does not stop. She grabs another arm from her mouth and attacks him with that. He dodges this attack. Disu says he will help him. Sia Jun tells them to stay back as most of their attacks will not affect her. It is a monster that has gone through stage 3. Hana tells Disu to wait for now. She knows a level 80 monster is too much for Disu to handle. Sia Jun jumps in the air and looks for an opening. He finds it at the back of her neck. As he gets closer, she turns her head. He apologizes to her and then swings his sword and cuts her neck in one attack. While looking at her dead body, Sia Jun thinks that after going through the third stage of dungeon sickness, Young Lee should be on par with D-class dungeon mobs. Normally, he would not be able to deal with someone like her. But thankfully, he leveled all his quest stats to 100 during the tutorial. He should be three times as strong now if he uses all his level up points. However, if he is at this level, those that used to be called the Celestials, if they were level 100, their actual stats would have been much higher. Disu tells others that the monsters are coming. They should not wait for the players as they all have become monsters. Siajin tells them those monsters are in the third stage of dungeon sickness. This stage is called greed. Suddenly, Hana notices something coming from the back. They notice that they are completely surrounded. Those monsters waited until they reached the ghost station. They all get ready to attack as they must leave this place. A monster approaches Ji Young. He swings his sword at him, but it does not help. He wonders how Sia Jun managed to kill one of them. Suddenly, Sia Jun appears from behind and kills that monster. He saves Ji Young again. He is speechless now. Sia Jun asks if she is sure the others are headed for Yongdungpo Station. She says they should have been. Since there is a nearby department store and plenty of other stores, they thought they would not have a problem restocking there. Sia Jun says they will head there too then. She asks what he means by that. She says it is dangerous to go now. There is more greed in that direction too. On top of that, she thinks she has an idea of what is ahead of them there. Sia Jun says even if the survivors did not go in that direction, he would have gone there anyway. Disu asks them what they are talking about. He replies he will explain later. For now, they should not get too far from him. The third stage of the dungeon sickness causes people to transform from their human state to a full monster state. Everyone goes through different transformations. Some people gain wings and others gain more arms or legs. There are some cases where people lose or gain weight too. The interesting thing is that people evolve based on the greed or desire they possess. Sia Jun says that they need to determine their desires to deal with them. When they develop a new eye, it is a manifestation of their desire to see more. Either they lost their sight when they were human, or they have something they want to see. That big-eyed monster rushes towards Sia Jun to attack, but he jumps in the air, takes out his phone, uses its light to make him close his eyes for a while, and then stabs him with his full strength. He says that it becomes easy once they understand their desire. Suddenly, his sword breaks as well. Its durability became zero, so it was destroyed. Seeing his tutorial item getting destroyed, Disu asks him if he wants his spear. He replies he does not need it. He has plenty of weapons. He summons Kakashi's thorn gauntlet and equips it. He looks at it and thinks while it will be more dangerous since the attack range is shorter than a longsword, the item itself will be effective. It's time to see what it is capable of. So, he rushes towards a huge monster. He grabs him by his shirt and smashes it on the ground. After that, he punches his face. He realizes that this item is best. Sia Jun felt the vibration and activated the dragon's eye to see the danger. He warns everyone to be careful as they are approaching his territory soon. Disu shockingly asks if this is what Sia Jun was talking about earlier. He replies yes and says this is where the trigger should be. He observed that once they reached that area, the greed stopped approaching. The red magic stream, it looks like their opponent is the trigger. 
he tells others it is a stage 3-5 near stage 4 monster. It seems the dungeon break from the fallen stage has caused this. Disu asks what's about dungeon flower. Siajun replies someone fed the target the dungeon flower and created the trigger. The trigger acts as a source of dungeon sickness. Once the spore virus enters the body and starts to multiply, the symptoms become worse. If they do not stop the trigger, dungeon sickness will consume soul. They reach the trigger. Siajun puts the flashlight on it. Seeing what's happening there, Disu starts screaming, but Hana tells him to stay calm. The monster is grabbing the people and eating them alive. It throws the rest of the body away, where already half-eaten dead bodies are lying. The monster speaks like she is doing a live stream and talking to her audience. She asks everyone if she should eat more. Then she tells them to like her video, subscribe to her channel, and share it. Siajun notices the blood floating in the air. He wonders how many people have died here. This scene is horrible. Disu asks him what the trigger is like. He replies he is unsure about the details. However, the trigger is like greed. He says that when one swallows the dungeon flower, depending on his desire, it determines his form. There is not a perfect strategy against it. Until they face it in person, they do not know anything for sure. Hana says that from the signs of battle on their way to Banju Station, and what Siajun mentioned, it looks like someone intentionally put the trigger inside Banju Station. Siajun uses his dragon eye and observes from his amount of mana that he must be over level 100. He should be on par with a D-rank middle boss. Looking at it, he can tell that, although it is slow, it has no other stats that are lower than theirs. But Dreamside is not a game that one can win like that. It is not a game that one wins just because he is at a higher level or has better stats. Just like how one can defeat a level 100 mob boss despite being level 40 himself, each monster has its own characteristics and activated buffs, and in certain situations, it is strong despite being a low level. He says that from the current form of this mob, it is strong or has most of its stats concentrated in health. The monster shouts and launches an attack on them, but they escape it. Siajun hears his shouting voice and thinks he recognizes this voice. Disu says that he is sure that the monster is Choi Mankey. Ji Young adds that the shout is the YouTuber's catchphrase. But that guy was in jail, so how this could be him? Disu says that he was given the death penalty because of a live streamed video on cannibalism. Although there are plenty of people who thought it was fake, it was proven to be human meat, and Choi Mankey was given the death penalty for that. In one word, before he became the trigger, he was incurable. Suddenly, the monster's hands start growing into multiple parts. He tries to smash the players using them. Siajun escapes it easily by jumping. Jiyun gets panicked by the sudden attack and cannot dodge. Disu helps him by cutting those tentacles. He also realizes that this monster is too much for him to handle. He tells others that the monster can move his arms freely, so they should be careful. Suddenly, the cut part of the monster, near Siajun's shoes, grows into an arm and grabs him. He frees himself using his gauntlets and says he cannot let his guard down even for a moment. Disu has to distract the monster to get some time to plan. He throws his spear at him. When he gets distracted, Disu signals Siajun to attack. He jumps o the air and punches his face with his gauntlets. The monster gets angry. He smirks and speaks in an addressing tone that since the first try did not work, they will do the second try. Siajun wonders if an attack like the previous one does not affect him. The monster changes his arms into cleavers. It seems he is imitating how he murdered his victims. He attacks them and tries to cut them. They all run away to save themselves. Hana grabs the monster's attention. He tells others that today's meat is an idol. She smirked and shot him, asking how he could think he would eat her. But her bullet does not show any damage either. She clenches her teeth and says it is disgustingly hard. Siajun tells her to be careful. He thinks the monster concentrates all of his stats on his health. He wonders if the monster needs strength or agility to eat. Then he sorts out that it's neither of them. The true answer is stamina. To eat, he needs the stamina to back it up. Siajun signals Hana to attack. They both rush towards him. Hana distracts him by calling him and shooting at him. The bullet hits his side face. Siajun uses the opportunity and approach the monster from the other side and punches him. This time, his punch shows its effect. The monster attacks back with one of his arms, but Siajun cuts it by attacking multiple times. They are glad to see that their attacks are working now. 
The monster peeks at Siajun and tries to stab him, but he jumps away and saves himself. He comes back to his team. Diso says that the attacks are working on that big guy is amazing. At this rate, they might be able to defeat it. Siajun says no. He adds although that can inflict some damage on him, he will not die from small attacks like this. He tells Disu and Hana that he has a plan. After a while, Jiyong stands up alone in front of the monster. He is scared, yet he yells at the monster, calls him a pig, and asks how much more he will eat. He is trying to make him angry and asks if this fat body of his can't even move anymore. His method works, and he screams in anger. As he opened his mouth, Disu jumped in and stuck his mouth, stabbing his spear into it. He signals Hana to shoot the bullet. Disu moves away, and the bullet hits the inside of the monster's mouth. The monster closes his mouth hurriedly. The bullet blasts inside his body and damages him from inside. The next turn is Siajun's to take. Before attacking, Siajun recalls the plan that they made. He said he needed the others to lure the monster into one place and buy him some time. Siajun thinks his current magic stat is at 100, so changing a stat by 100 will make a big difference. If he invests the points earned during the tutorial, it might be possible to use unique skills locked until he reaches 200. He decides that he will deliver the final blow. He activates his magic concentration skill. He says that if the opponent is strong, he just needs to be stronger. On the other hand, the monster smirked and asked his imaginary viewers if they wanted him to eat the raw meat. He casts a net around Siajun and traps him inside it. Siajun breaks that trap with one blow. This also melts the monster's arms. Iujun rushes towards him to hit, saying he will like and subscribe just like he asked. He will even do this twice. He concentrates all his strength on his fist and punches him from below. That one strike slams the monster into the roof. The system announces that Choi Mankey, the hunger trigger, has been defeated. Siajun's level has been upgraded. He has obtained the attention seeker's ring. Choi Mankey's body falls to the ground and he returns to his human form. Siajun and others gather around him. Disu says that now that Mankey is dead, the mana within his body is dissipating into the atmosphere. He can confirm that it is Choi Mankey. Siajun thinks he does not know who did this or why, but he needs to figure it out. Suddenly, he notices a mark on his neck. It's an electric bolt crossing through two moons. Somewhere inside a room, the candles are lit. A pink orb falls to the ground. Someone picks it up and sees Siajun's reflection in it. The guy holding the orb is stunned to see K. He thinks he manages five farms within Seoul. Although he checks on triggers of each farm occasionally, this is the first time he has seen someone capable of using an attack as strong as that. He still does not want to believe that it is K. Suddenly, someone calls him by his name, Bi Jichen, and says he always acts like he is the only one who is busy. The guy is company-affiliated Kang Minho. He tells Bi Jichen to admit that he is messing around. Bi Jichen takes off his hood. He is a handsome guy with gray hair who is affiliated with the company. The company is the dark side of the dream side. The company, consisting of a small group, expands the dungeons within the dream side, endangering people as a cancerous being to the world. Those associated with the company have a mark to prove it. It is a lightning bolt piercing two moons. Bi Jichen goes to Kang Minho and says he has arrived at the perfect time. He has observed something concerning. Minho, without taking a look, says it seems K is alive. Jichen is surprised to hear that from him. Minho tells him it is a report from the newbie that they sent to the Labyrinth of Choice. It looks like the number of challengers in Hell difficulty is now zero. Jichen asks if there's any chance K died. Minho replies that it is always a possibility. However, if he is alive, it will become an issue for their future plans. Jichen says that's why they would like his cooperation to locate him. He wants all of his men. Minho is surprised to hear his words. Jichen says it is possible he already found all of them. Inside the subway, Siajun and others are progressing towards the next station. Jichen thinks that in his form as croc, he possesses unerasable data and using the authority of predation, he can eat humans to understand Earth's current situation. However, thinking K would make it out of the tutorial alive makes Jichen worried that he has already advanced. Minho interrupts his thinking and asks what he is so worried about. He laughs and tells him they are not the people they know. Even K is just a newbie who just finished the tutorial. That is why they will let the higher-ups know about this. If they are sure it is him, they need to kill him now. In an underground tunnel, a player is running away from the monsters. 
While running, he wonders if these guys do not get tired. He cannot lose them. He thinks those people turned into monsters so quickly he cannot believe it. He ran in the wrong direction too. If he does not head back, he won't be able to meet up with Detective Disu, and he will just die. But now he does not know what he should do. Suddenly, he sees a train coming this way. He looks at it, thinks it has been three months since they lost power, and wonders why a train is at a ghost station. He looks back to where the monsters are just approaching him. He thinks there is no time to worry about things like this. He needs to get out of this place first. He jumps to the sidewalk and starts running there. Suddenly, the system informs him that the train leaves soon, so all users must arrive as soon as possible. The doors are about to close. That player rushes and gets inside the train. The train leaves and all those monsters look at that player from the windows. That guy is relaxed and says if he can stay on this train and get away, he might be able to get to Irongdunpo station and meet up with Detective Disu. He hopes nothing bad happens from now. While he thinks this, the system informs him that he has entered the D-rank dungeon, the running ghost train. This is a themed dungeon. An attendant will come to check his ticket soon. If he does not have a ticket, he will become a target of the attendant. That guy is shocked as he enters another hell while escaping the first. Siyajun and others keep running and reach the Young Dunpo station's underground tunnel. Jiyoung looks at Siyajun and thinks it is hard to believe this nerd is K. Although unsure he understood after seeing him defeat the trigger. Jiyoung is now so obsessed with K. Hana looks at Jiyoung who is behaving strangely and wonders if that is a symptom of dungeon sickness and if she should kill him. Disu says that looking at the state of the place they just passed, he does not think there may be any survivors. He says that if the trigger was closing off the tunnel like that, he does not think anyone could escape. Siyajun says there must be survivors, and he is sure of that. Disu asks what he means by that. He replies that this is like fishing. The ones that escaped are most likely infected. Someone is purposely letting people survive. And once the herd finds those survivors, they are eaten alive. Someone artificially made the trigger. The symptoms will worsen, and someone will become a new trigger like Choi Menki. Siyajun thinks he does not know who is behind this, but he will not let them get away with it, especially if it is the company. He thinks that they were NPCs considered to be on the bad side. They can generate quests and try recruiting players to join them. As they slowly grew their ranks, a single player wiped them out. That single player was K. During that time, he took the time to clear each of the dungeons they created to relieve stress, and for a while, his personal enjoyment in the dream side was destroying the company. It is no wonder they dislike him. But this is reality. It is no longer a game. He thinks that whether this is the real company or if a player group is just following the company, he needs to keep an eye out for them. They enter the Yongdungpo station. Disu says that it looks like this is a ghost station. He tells them that they prepared these tracks to evacuate Yongdungpo station in case of an emergency. He looks at the supplies that were stashed for people to use. They hid them when they came here last time. Siyajun says this would even be helpful for players since their inventory space is not infinite. Suddenly, he notices some drink cans taken out from the carton. Disu becomes glad seeing this as this means someone has been here. Siyajun suddenly remembers something. He asks Disu if the people at Banju Station are not players yet. He says he is aware that children and the elderly, along with injured people, cannot be players, but most ordinary adults should be able to become players if they clear the tutorial. Before Disu answers, Hana says that the internet was cut off, and that's why some people could not become players. He asks Hana if she can use the internet. She says yes. She upgraded her phone recently. She can contact people with this receiver as she has it on her arm. However, because there is a level restriction, only players can use it. The only way to become a player is to go to the Ark. Siyajun is surprised to hear about this place. She says that although she has not been there often, it is the last stronghold within Seoul. At Banju Station, some of those red players arrive to check. They look at the dead bodies of the zombies on the stairs. Team leader Yoon Byungu looks at the situation and says Bi Jichin was right. Suddenly, the same ghost train arrives there, and the system announces and tells the players to get on the train as soon as possible. Byungo knows that it is the rumored theme dungeon. But this train should be on line 1, so why is it on line 10? One of the subordinates says that there was a lot of construction work done, so it is possible that they connected the lines. He asks if they cannot get on this and go since the train is heading for Yongdungpo station. 
Bayongo asks him if he wants to die. He tells his subordinates that this is a D-rank dungeon. Although it is within their jurisdiction, they cannot handle it. If they go in, they will all just die. Bayongo thinks that he entered this company to stay alive. He refuses to die here. One says that Bi Jichen told them to follow him. Bayongo tells him to shut up and asks him if he does not understand that they cannot do this. Even if they do not get on the train, the goblins will take care of them if their enemies take it. Ark is a term that represents Noah's Ark. Siajun thinks that it is a fitting name for Seoul's last stronghold. Hana says they can update her receiver and upgrade her phone. That's why they decided to head in that direction. Siajun says that it is possible that the survivors are headed for the Ark. Disu signals them and says they need to start moving. He is sure they are not that far ahead. Suddenly, Gorong comes out of his pocket. He smells the scent of a snack nearby. He points in a direction. Siajun also senses something. He warns others that someone else is here too. They run upstairs to check. Hana asks if someone is there and why they are running away. Disu says he is unsure as well. Maybe they think they are the greed. Siajun says they are the only ones in this quiet place. There is no way that someone would be unable to recognize that they are human. He feels sorry for not telling that the people they are chasing are not the survivors of Banju Station. He thinks that them running away and looking back at them is one thing, but seeing that they deliberately slowed their pace down means they are trying to lure them. They reach the waiting room while chasing. Ji Young asks why they are here. Suddenly, an arrow approaches him. It is about to pierce through him, but Siajun quickly grabs it and saves his life. Then, smoke appeared and covered the entire waiting room. After that, a series of arrows are shot at them. Siajun warns Hana. She shoots those arrows with her gun. Siajun and Disu realize they do not need to worry about her. Siajun says that whoever they are, they are hostile towards them. They both keep dodging the arrows and moving forward. Siajun sees someone's shadow and excitedly says that he has found them. He throws a punch at them. But when he sees a terrified kobold in front, he wonders if a dungeon break occurs nearby. He does not hit him and tells Hana not to shoot him. But she has already pulled the trigger. The bullet just touches kobold's arm and leaves. She says she made sure she missed it since she felt bad. She asks what this matter is. Ji Young affectionately says that since he trusts Siajun, he is sure he has his reasons to stop them. Siajun points at kobold and says he is not a monster. Others are confused to hear that. Siajun says this guy and all those other kobolds are people. One of them, wearing glasses, asks if those four are not workers. The four wonder who the workers are. That talking kobold says his name is Shin Hyunwoo. He admits that what happened earlier was a misunderstanding, and they are not the monsters. Disu whispers in Siajun's ear and asks if these things are real people. They look like monsters to him. He replies that Disu must have noticed that the, the names of the monsters have colors. He asks them what color the names of the kobolds are. When no one answers he tells them that it is white. He says these people are players and different from the greed. The name of the greed cannot be white. He asks the kobold why they attack them first and if they are enemies of humans. They tell in sign language that they are not enemies. Siajun asks if that's not the matter, why did they attack them? That guy replies that it is all because of the worker. Shin Hyunwoo tells his story from the start. He says that on the opening day of the dream side, he logged in to the account. He got a crude longsword as a weapon. But rather than worrying about things, he focused on getting used to everything. It was a game that he was addicted to before he joined the military. He was around level 202. There were plenty of items as register rewards. However, because of the service ended while he was serving, he was too late to register for the rewards. Even so, he had experience. It was better than nothing. After that, he met with the Tian Dungpo survivor group and they decided to make it out together. He was faced with a decision. But he cleared the labyrinth of choice with normal difficulty. The only person who managed to clear the normal difficulty was Shin Hyunwu. They started to focus on surviving with him at the focus. This thought terrified him that he would be the focus when he barely got through the normal difficulty. It was sure that they would struggle without any high-level players. The situation was dangerous. That's when a mysterious merchant started appearing throughout Yongdunpo Station. Chin Hyunwoo says they should not have accepted his offers at that time as they regret it now. He says that that merchant supplied them with great items and food and he was kind too. He constantly provided them with food and weapons to use. They were thankful. 
That's how they managed to survive. But it turned out he was a fraud. The survivors lacked the means to pay for what the merchants provided. They lured them in by saying they would invest in their future and were only there to help them. The conditions they put were a double-sided contract. While they did not know at the time, the food that the merchants gave them was filled with drugs. The contract that they signed had a fine print. If they failed to pay the contracted amount, the fine print stated that they would have to give up their bodies in return. Those frauds stole their bodies. What appeared after the merchants was a being called the worker. As the fine print stated, they took their bodies and disappeared. Their souls were forcibly placed into these cobbles. That was merely the start. The worker came every week. He claimed that he came to collect the interests stated on the contract, and what he took from them were their memories. Siajun is shocked to hear that. He thinks that might be why the other kobold cannot talk. He asks them if any other people from Banju Station come by here. Shin Hyunwoo shakes his head and says no one did. Siajun asks him how much each person's total debt is. He recipes it is about the same. Siajun asks Hat about the interest. He replies that is the same too. Siajun angrily asks when those workers are coming here again. Suddenly, a kobold comes running and warns that the workers are here. Everyone hides from there. Hana asks Siajun if he is okay as he looks bad. He peeks at the workers and says he is just a little angry. He says the total amount is about the same, and there's no difference in interest either. Hana says that is what he said. Siajun says the degree of their memory loss is different. Some lost even their memory of how to speak, and others are more or less fine. He wonders why there is a difference in memory loss. Hana thinks it is because each person's total amount of memories differs. 23-year-old Shin Hyunwoo has 23 years worth of memories. In other words, those who have fewer memories are most likely children. Disu asks why Shin Hyunwoo is doing all this to defeat the workers. Siajun questions them about what they think happens when a human loses all of their memories. Hana and Disu are stunned to imagine as they know the answer. Such humans become monsters. Disu says the souls in the Kabul bodies are human. That's why they are considered players. He is angry at the workers. Kobold creates the fog as the workers enter there. That blue worker threatens them not to try to do anything. He hits them with his hammer. Some kobold shoot arrows at the worker. He just deflects them with his hand gesture. But kobold throws bombs at him. As they blast, kobolds become excited about their success. But the effect of the blast on the worker was zero. He grabs one of the kobolds by his head and demands money. Then he smashes his head and kills him. He says that if they borrowed the money, they must repay it. The worker rushes to another kobold to grab him, but Siajun jumps in between and cuts the worker's hand. Hana also shoots that worker and kills him. She asks Siajun if he is okay. He replies yes and thanks her. The other workers are confused about seeing humans there. Siajun also wonders why it had to be a goblin. He can already tell he is going to be solid. His level is 80, and he is a player too. That worker tells Siajun not to bother him. Siajun asks him if he is not a human too. But then he says they should forget about it as there is no point in talking to a goblin. He grabs him by his horn and throws him to the ground. Then he picks up his hammer and smashes the goblin's face. Siajun says that killing their own kind is the only way to become a goblin. He says goblins are different from the kobolds. Suddenly, the red goblin attacks him with fire. Siajun activates his dragon's eyes and asks that goblin, if he never learned, must not play with fire. He runs towards it and tells Hana to take care of the rest of the goblins for him. He crosses that fire barrier and reaches that goblin. He punches that goblin's head with his full strength and smashes it in one strike. After defeating the second goblin, he has leveled up. He has also earned a reward. Siajun holds the contract and reads it. He says the contract has been unfair from the start. He thinks maybe they had a special item that obstructed th content of the contract. The others have killed the remaining goblins as well. Suddenly, an aura is released by those dead bodies. Diso asks what it is. Siajin says it may be the souls of the players. At the same time, the souls of the kobolds leave their bodies and they start dying as well. Disu and Hana are shocked and ask Siajun what they should do. Siajun reads the hidden condition on the other side of the paper that if the contractee causes any worker issues, the contractor gains complete authority over the contractee. The souls of all the players combine and leave that place. Siajun says they need to follow it. He says that if they don't, the children will be in danger. While chasing those souls they come downstairs. 
they are surprised to see a train at the station. Siyajun wonders how a train is at line 10, as this station has incomplete lines. Suddenly, Gorong comes out of Siyajun's pocket. He senses a feast inside the train and can't hide his excitement. Siyajun now understands what the matter is. The doors of the train open. With dungeons being Dreamside's main goal, various dungeons appear. Among them, moving dungeons in boats, planes, and carriages exist. Siyajun thinks that seeing it just appeared before them, he is sure this train is a moving dungeon. Hana points at something and tells Siyajun to look there. The souls of the players enter the train. Disu asks Siyajun what they should do. Siyajun counter-questions him on what he would prefer to do. He is sure that Disu can tell it is a dungeon. He adds that if they enter, they might lose the chance of finding the survivors of Banju Station. Disu replies that Kobold said there were no other people there. He says that if there were survivors, there's no way they would ignore Yongdeungpo Station and escape to the next station. Since there were also no signs of battle here, he does not believe the greed has arrived either. He fiercely says that although it might seem cruel, rather than chasing people who may or may not be alive, he would rather save the lives of the children right in front of him. Siajin says that it is decided now. They are entering the dungeon. Gong Jiwon, who entered the train earlier, huffs as he struggles. He lifts his face and says he does not want to die. Suddenly, something tackles him. It is a baby goblin. He tries to attack him with his knife, but it dodges. Jiwon wonders how he is supposed to defeat it within 10 minutes. There are many of them, and they are making him angry by throwing things at him. They are hitting him from different directions. Jiwon observes that they are not attacking him at the same time. They are just playing with him. Suddenly, one hits him from behind, and he falls on his face. The system informs him that he has failed to obtain the ticket and is confirmed to be a free rider. He has become a target of the station attendant. As he lifts his face, he finds a huge goblin in a suit. G1 tries to crawl away, but that guy grabs him by his face. He falls unconscious. The attendant drags him away. When G1 opened his eyes, he saw a scary guy screaming and rushing toward him. G1 is scared and hurriedly moves away. But then he notices that many players are chained in that scary state. He wonders what kind of hell he is in. In the Ned car of the train, the baby goblins are angry as the attendant takes away their human toy, and now they have nothing to play with. Suddenly, some shadows appear on the floor. The baby goblin looks at the bodies causing those shadows. These are Siyajun and his fellows. He looks at those baby goblins and says although they may look cute, they should be around level 70. They are a species that loves to kill humans. Hana looks around and tells Siyajun that this looks more like a cargo compartment of a steam train rather than a metro. He replies it is because it is a D-rank dungeon. The interiors and the exteriors of the dungeon are completely different. He says that the E-rank dungeon, the Faelin School, was also an ordinary high school, but the interior was much bigger than expected. But here, the issue is outside the window. He looks outside the window and says they are not underground anymore. He says he already knew this was not an ordinary dungeon. The quest started as soon as they entered. The system tells him that this is Area F and an attendant will come to check their tickets soon. Siyajun looks at those baby goblins. He knows this is a themed dungeon and to clear it, they need to figure out the rules of this dungeon and solve it. The goblins rush towards them to attack, but he punches the face of one. The system says that Siyajun has obtained a ticket. The others also beat the other baby goblins and obtain the ticket. While holding their kickers, Disu asks if they have cleared the dungeon. Jiyoung says he thinks they have. Siyajun tells them to throw away the tickets. They do not have enough time to clear the dungeon using ordinary methods. He asks how long they think it will take to go through each train car like this. He smiles and says they need to think outside the box. Gorong eats all those tickets. Hana asks if they will not become the target of the station attendant. He replies that is exactly why they will throw those tickets away. He says since the souls of those children are being taken somewhere, although it might be dangerous, they need to clear this dungeon differently. That's why they will wait for them to check their ticket and defeat the station attendant. Jian notices those baby goblins running away and asks others if something is wrong with those goblins. Those babies have hidden themselves. He asks jokingly if they are scared of Kay. Siyajun tells everyone to get ready as the station attendant is coming. He is the first goblin. He comes opposite Siyajun and demands him to show his ticket. He replies that he does not have one. The attendant says it means he is traveling free. Siyajun does not answer him. 
instead, he throws a punch at him from below and throws him away. The goblin lifts his head and peeks at Siajun. He grabs his hammer and launches an attack on him angrily. He jumps and escapes it. Then he grabs him by his horn and throws a knee kick in his face. Next, he punches in his gut and defeats him. After beating him well, Siajun grabs him by the horn and asks if he is the station attendant. The goblin does not answer, so Siajun repeats his question by putting a blade on his neck. The system screen shows up and tells him he must defeat the goblin babies to get the ticket. Otherwise, he will be a target of the station attendant. Siajun sighs and asks if the system is kidding with him. He says this quest would have been pointless if the final goal was to defeat the attendant. He again addresses the goblin by sitting on his chest and asking where he has hidden the souls and why he is not answering. He replies that he does not know. Siajun again threatens him and says he does not have time to waste, so he better tell him. He finally says they are in Area D and all merchants are gathered there. That's all he knows. Siajun asks him to hand him over the keys. He knows the goblin can go in and out of Area F. He is sure it can go to other regions without clearing the quests. The first goblin unwantedly handed over that pouch of keys to Siajun. He walks away, saying that the goblin deserved it anyway. He takes the key out of the pouch. Siajun says they must leave. They have no time to waste. Disu asks him if that goblin is not also a player. Jion asks what if that person is also a victim. Siajun replies that goblins are different from the kobolds. One cannot become a goblin by having their soul stolen. First, they murder their kind. Second, they eat their kind. In other words, to be a goblin, they need to eat human flesh. That's why there is no need to treat these goblins like humans. Others are shocked to hear these facts. They enter the next car, one after another, and keep going. Siajun has obtained the title of High Speed Dungeon Breaker. The amount of experience he obtains from dungeons will increase by 2%. Disu asks Siajun if it is fine. He has heard they cannot defeat themed dungeons without clearing the quests. Siajun replies that Disu is right. But that is not the only answer. He says that clearing dungeons is up to the player's ability. Whether they take an orthodox route or do something unconventional. Disu asks if that is an unconventional play. Siajun smiles and says some people might call it an Easter egg. Other people would call it cheating. He is sure there will be more cases like this. He says that they are already following someone who is a borderline cheat. Siajun opens the door of the guest room tree shelter and enters. They see people are having their meal there. That merchant is also there. Siajun looks around and finds some luggage and some prisoners there. Then he looks at that merchant. That merchant, Song Diokpal, stands up and asks Siajun if he has the ticket. Siajun smirks and says he has no tickets. They come opposite to each other. Suddenly, Siajun says, isn't the weather hot today? Everyone wonders what he is talking about suddenly. Song Diokpal tells Siajun to follow him. Disu tells Hana to be ready. Song Diokpal takes them to the dining table and says it must have been a long journey getting here, so they must grab a bite. Hearing this, Hana hides her pistol. They all sit around the table. The merchants introduce themselves by their names. Siajun smiles and says he is glad to meet them. Disu whispers in his ear what this is all about. He replies that he got something interesting from the goblin pouch. It was a secret code. When he thinks about it, chasing the souls is not the answer. They must find a way to get those children's souls back into their bodies. To do that, he needs to get information about the contract from these merchants. That is his intention. But suddenly, the goblins appear there and attack them. Siajun wonders when the merchants realize their bluff. Song Diokpal laughs and says he does not know how Siajun found out about their code, but that was last month's code. Sojourn says he did not think they would be this thorough with it. They all kill the goblins in no time. The merchants are shocked and try to leave for F6. But Disu stands at the door and asks them where they are going in a hurry. He says that he will skip the Miranda rites since they lack time. Those men attack him together, thinking Disu is alone, and they can take him. But Disu beats all of them well using his staff. Siajin goes to Song Diokpal and says he hoped to make things easier for him. He asks him to tell everything he knows. Diokpal asks him if he thinks someone like him can face Lord Jack. Siajun is stunned to hear that name. Diokpal laughs, seeing his shocked face, and says it looks like he finally understands what he has done. He says Siajun has just declared war against the ninth-ranked Lord Jack. Suddenly, Siajun starts laughing hysterically. Everyone wonders what has happened to him. 
Sia Jun asks if that crook Jack is behind all of this. Rank 9 Dungeon Merchant Jack raised to the top with a non-combat class merchant. There are two ways people describe him. The first is that Jack is cruel and one should never buy money from him. The second is that Jack is trustworthy. His offers are always fair and truthful and he possesses the best items in the world. He appears wherever a customer needs him and disappears as soon as possible, earning him the title of Mirage. Sia Jun thinks that although Jack's stuff is expensive, he gives a free delivery. Sia Jun grabs Diokpol by his collar and says Jack stole his items through trading fraud before the server ended, and Diokpol tells him that Jack is here. Suddenly, a foam comes out of his mouth. Sia Jun is stunned to see his sudden death. Then his soul leaves his body. The same is happening with the other merchants. Sia Jun thinks that it is just like the kobolds. Hana asks him if that is all because of Jack. Sia Jun says he did not think Jack would be this bad person. Ji Young asks if Jack is that bad of a guy. Hana hatefully says that Jack is the greatest crook. Yet, he does everything with a smile. If it was not for him, she would not have had trouble with her guns. Sia Jun asks Hana if Jack got her too. Hana gets that Sia Jun was also his victim. Sia Jun wonders if Jack managed to scam all the rankers. Disu says they should leave Jack on the list of possible suspects. They do not have enough evidence. Hana asks if it is okay if she beats him up when they meet. Sia Jun says she can, but first, they must free the prisoners. Disu frees the people on one side and says he is done over here. Sia Jun says he is almost done on his side too. Suddenly, he sees a person that is not tied up. Suddenly, he notices the angel's earring on him and thinks one person can only possess a unique item. It's Jack, sitting there with the prisoners. He instantly tells them that this is a big misunderstanding. They have the wrong person. Sia Jun asks why he has those earrings. He replies that he bought them for 10,001. Suddenly, Hana shoots a bullet near him to threaten him. She angrily tells him not to kid with them. She asks him if he did all of this. That guy surrenders and accepts that he is Jack. He tells his side of the story. He only did it when he tricked all the rankers because he thought the servers were done for. He regrets the decision he made back then. He is the ninth ranked merchant Jack and his name is Jai Sangsu. Sia Jun says he must have misunderstood. They are not talking about what he did during Dream Side 1. They are talking about what happened just now. Sangsu smiles and apologizes to Kay, saying he had no idea the game would continue. Sia Jun asks him how he knows he is Kay. After listening to him, Sia Jun asks if he is telling him that he came searching for his imposter and happened to meet them. Sangsu says that half of it is right. He says he was chasing them with a GPS. He tells him that a GPS tracks a specific player. He received that as his server termination bonus. He smiles and says he did that because there was no better way to earn money than by being on his side. Disu tells Ji Young he never thought Jack would be a 14-year-old kid. That is surprising for all of them. Sangsu addresses Clark and says he has been waiting to say this. He is embarrassed, but he is her fan. She is surprised that he has always known she is Clark. He says that of course he knew. He wonders if she remembers him from all the fan signs he has been to. She says she does remember, but it is hard to digest that a cute middle schooler would be Jack. She pulls her cheeks to show some affection. Sia Jun asks him who is the imposter he mentioned. He replies that someone is using his name. It has not been long since he got that information. During the last three months, he wandered around Seoul when the GPS was not picking them up. That's when those dirty merchants approached him. He heard them talking about Jack. Although it was odd, he took food and the contract. It was only after he nullified everything with the angel's earring. Then he decided to follow them since he saw a chance to make money and find the imposter. That's when that merchant, Song, mentioned attending an auction by importer Jack. They ask what kind of auction he is talking about. He replies that there is a black market in the newly opened D5 area. The auction there is planned to have a variety of rare items. Sia Jun asks if those people too would be sold there. He replies yes. He says that while they were on the topic of merchants, there were no messages when Sia Jun defeated them. Sia Jun just ponders about that. He says that they were red players and they should have given experience and items on their death, just like the monsters. Sang Su says that they did not die, but they abandoned their bodies. They can move their souls to empty bodies. Thus, those people are being sold at the auction as extra lives. The host of this event is nicknamed the Master of Goblinsa and his imposter. 
Hana asks why that guy is called the Mater of Goblins. He replies that it is how goblins work. The first goblins follow the orders of the second goblins. The second goblins follow the orders of the great third goblin Lycan. One that is above them all and even gives out orders to the Lycan is the master of goblins. Siajun says that it seems like he is the cause of everything. Siajun has found his next target. Disu thinks they should go as they have a reason to hurry now. Hana asks if the next area is E. Sangsu says he has a plan. He points at the roof and says he will explain it as they use the shortcut. They all climb to the roof of the train. Siajun angrily asks if this is a shortcut. Sangsu replies that it is fast at least. Siajun asks him what his plan is. He replies that he knows which cabin the black market is being held at. They will sneak in and extract the information. Siajun wonders if there's any they can learn. The system notifies him that he has entered the hidden area train roof. The secret quest, Night of the Reapers, begins. Siajun angrily says that he thought it was a safe path. Sangsu embarrassingly says that he heard it was. The specters appear and launch an attack on them. Siajun equips his gauntlets and attacks. Sangsu says since the specters are ghost types, physical attacks will not work on them. Siajun says he knows it already. He activates his magic concentration skill. He concentrates his mana and uses it in a single strike. This way, he defeats the specter. He has to hurry up and beat the rest. Sangsu tells Siajun to wait. But when he looks around, he cannot find Sangu. He asks him where he is. Sangsu appears behind him and whispers in his ear that he is here. He laughs and says it is his item's special invisibility skill. That's why he is called Mirage. He suggests that Siajun think again about defeating the specters. Siajun asks Han if he thinks he will lose to them. He assures them that he will get rid of them quickly. Sangsu says the real issue will come after defeating them. Their mother Banshee will appear if he defeats all the specters. Siajun thinks of a good idea and says this is a shortcut. A specter rushes to attack Choi Hana. She says he looks disgusting and shoots a bullet at him. Suddenly, Siajun jumps and catches her bullet before it hits the specter. While running he tells them not to try to get rid of the specters. Hana is still shocked and asks how he caught her bullet. Disu asks why he does not want them to eliminate these specters. He tells them that a boss banshee will appear if they defeat all the specters, but they do not have enough time to defeat the banshee. That's why they will sue the banshee. They do not understand what he wants to see. A few minutes later, the specter is chasing Ji Yang. They attack him and his defense has decreased by 7%. He asks Disu to help him. Disu tells him to keep running as the specter is coming again. He recalls that Siajun wanted Ji Yang and Disu to lure the specters, and he accepted this job. Now he is crying, saying Siajun never told him there would be so many. Inside one of the cars, the imposter Jack enjoys a fight and drinks wine. Suddenly, Lycan comes there and the screen disappears. The fake Jack looks at him, offended, and asks if he wants to die. He throws his glass of wine at him and says Lycan bores him. There is no point in this expensive anymore. Lycan glares at him. The fake Jack asks him why he is looking at him like that. The cap on Jack's head is the goblin headpiece. It is an omnipotent item that can control all goblins. Due to its effects, he controls all the goblins. Even a goblin like Lycan has to bow before him. The fake Jack asks him what the useless goblin has to report to him. Lycan says that he has received reports that the station attendant, the first goblin, has been attacked. Jack asks what about the scouts they sent. Lycan tells him to take a look at the screen. There's footage of Siajun standing on the first goblin's body. Jack says that this is strange. He thinks the station attendant was on par with the second goblins. It is unbelievable that some soul players can defeat the second goblins. In the second footage, he sees Choi Hana, and his mouth is wide open with shock at seeing an idol here. He smirks and changes the plan. He orders Lycan to capture the intruders, bring the girl, and kill the rest of them. Songsu, Siajun, and Hana are inside the train cabin D6. She asks them if Detective Disu and Ji Young will be okay outside. Siajun replies that they will be. He says Ji Young has the highest defense stat out of all of them. Since Detective Disu was from the special cases department, he is well trained. Suddenly, Sangsu stops. He says they have reached cabin D5, where the entire world's greed is on auction. This is the black market entrance. He says that inside the black market, people use masks to hide their identities. However, he has only one mask, and there are three of them. 
Hana asks what they should do to get in. They cannot just let someone go in alone. Sangsu smirked and asked who said they only let one of them go in. He lends his cloak to Siajun. This is the cloak of the secluded and it can use the invisibility skill. He tells Siajun to use this to sneak into the black market and find out more about the contracts. Siajun asks if they still do not need one more mask. Sangsu says he has something for that too. At the casino area, inside the black market, merchants wearing masks are having a good time. Siajun passes by some of them. He is wearing the clock and no one can see them. As he passes by a few, they think they felt a wind blow. Siajun thinks that D5 was not a door, it was a portal. This dungeon is a lot bigger than he expected. He wonders where he should start searching. Suddenly, he sees a goblin who looks suspicious. That guy opens a door and enters. Ji Young and Disu are still luring the specters on the train's roof. Disu tells Ji Young that he is a good runner. He says he would never fail a task K gave him. He wonders if everything is going well for them. Song Su and Hana have entered the black market as well. Hana is just wearing a hood and her face is not veiled. She whispers and asks if he is sure this plan will work. He replies of course it will. She asks what is the plan B if it fails. Suddenly, a goblin asks them if they are merchants and what goods they sell. Choi Hana takes off her hood instead of answering. The goblin recognizes her. She is the girl Jack told them to bring to him. He softens his tone and asks them to follow him to a more private space. Sangsu says this is perfect. While they go with him, a man in a panda mask observes them. On the other hand, Siajun is exploring the prison. He sees an orc there and says he never thought he would see an orc being sold. He hears someone coming and wears his cloak to hide himself. He sees that some orcs are bringing a human there. He thinks there are more victims of the contracts. It seems like he is in the right spot. Suddenly, he observes that human and recognizes him. He is Gong Ji Won from the skeleton hunt. It seems he is conscious, but he does not look good. However, even if he wants to save those people and Gong Ji Won, he does not have enough time. He will need to talk about this with Detective Disu later. He runs away to find a second goblin that might know something. Suddenly, he finds a second goblin. He takes off his cloak and jumps to punch him. While following that goblin, Hana asks Sangsu where he is taking them. He thinks he is taking them to auction. As they are about to enter a room, they see that fake Jack and Lycan standing beside him. She sees the three horns and wonders if he is a third goblin. Sangsu wonders if the guy next to the goblin is his imposter. The fake Jack asks her if it is the idol Choi Hana. Sangsu notices the guy's hat and wonders if it is the goblin headpiece. Now he understands why the goblins have been following his orders. But that's not how one is supposed to use that. The fake Jack says he only asked for Choi Hana and asks who the small guy next to her is. He orders Lycan to kill that small guy. Sangsu tells him to wait and says he wants to say something. The imposter signals Lycan to stop. He asks Sangsu if he knows who he is. He replies, of course. He adds that as a merchant, there is no way he could not know Jack. The imposter laughs and says he looks like a smart guy. He asks Sangsu if he wants a drink. Sangsu says he cannot decline the offer. Those three sit around a table. The imposter tells them to have a drink. It is not poisoned. He asks them why they are here. Sangsu says they are here for an exclusive trade agreement. He says his client wants to bypass the black market and have a direct connection to get large quantities of high quality goods. The imposter says they will need a lot of fun to do so. Sangsu shows him his funds and asks if they are enough. Hana is surprised to see 10 million gold in Sangsu's account and wonders how he collected that much money. She is impressed by him. The imposter says that only the funds are not enough. He wants to be certain that he can trust his clients. Sangsu maintains his cool and says he cannot reveal his client's identity. However, he will let him know they are famous within Ark. Hearing this, the imposter sighs and says it must be him then. Sangsu wonders what he is talking about. He just used Ark to redirect his attention though. The imposter tells his servant to bring the document. Sangsu asks him if he has prepared the paperwork already. The imposter replies that it is because they were expecting them to come. Sangsu wonders who this imposter is misunderstanding them for. But still, he gets ready to sign. As he signs the papers, a chain emerges around his hand. He asks the imposter what he did to him. The imposter smirks and tells him not to take it too personally. He asks if he does not think they need a way to ensure everything goes well. 
the system informs Sang Su that the effect of the double-sided contract has been activated and his body has been locked. His inventory has been locked as well. With that, the imposter's name appears on the screen on his head. He is a bound player, Jack. Jack laughs and says he hopes this deal benefits both of them. Sang Su tells him that it seems he is making a big misunderstanding. He asks if he thinks he is the only one with something up his sleeve. Suddenly, the roof of the cabin breaks and the specters reach there. One places his weapon at Jack's neck. He orders Lycan to protect him. Lycan takes care of all those specters. Jack laughs and says they are idiots if they thought they would use mere specters to go against Lycan. As Lycan kills those specters, the other goblins try to hold Disu and others, but Ji Young and Disu fight them. Disu asks Hana if they are late. She says their timing could not be more perfect. Jack yells and asks Sang Su if he thought he got him well. He threatens him and says it is his turn to get punished now. The double sided contract activates. Jack tells him to accept the consequences of his actions. The chain around his hand starts giving him electric shocks. Hana asks him if he is right. He says yes. The chain starts disappearing automatically. The contract in Jack's hands burns itself. He asks Sang Su how he nullified the contract. He smirked and said he did not know as well. It just disappeared. Jack yells at him and asks if he would accept that as an answer. Sang Su tells him that his breath stinks. He tells Jack he does not think he is the worst of his worries. He says that Jack's goblin has defeated all the specters. So here she comes. A large aura of death, the mother of the specters, and the boss monster Banshee have appeared. On the other side, Si Jun tells that half-dead goblin to stop overacting and get up. He wants the answer to his questions. He asks him where the double-sided contract is. He replies that the boss, the owner of goblins, Lord Jack has it. Sia Jun asks him why they treat him as their owner. He replies that it is because he has the goblin headpiece. Sia Jun wonders if Jack managed to bring the server end reward from Dreamside 1. He asks the goblin where this Jack is. He replies that Lord Jack is in D10. He adds that he is a person. They fooled him and became a goblin. He has no choice but to listen to Lord Jack because of that headpiece. Siajun punches him and says he is well aware of their reality. He wears his cloak and starts rushing to find D10. Banshee activities her power and releases a ghost whale. Jiyun is scared and wonders how she screamed a woman's and child's voices mixed. Disu is stunned as well. He tells him that this is the sound of countless people crying. She is highest highest ranking specter mob, the ghost banshee. They hope this ghost Banshee becomes their ally, even for a moment. Banshee is standing opposite Lycan, holding her sickle. Jack says he is impressed that they pulled a Banshee in this matter. He tells them they have made a huge mistake as none of them can touch a hair on his head. He commands Lycan, who replies that he has understood the assignment. He rushes towards her and tries to hit her with his hammer, but she dodges it swiftly. That attack releases a huge shockwave. Disu creates a shield for three seconds to protect himself and others. The goblins standing in front of them fall to the ground. Disu assumes that they could not endure the shockwave from Lycan. Sangsu says that the shockwave was short, but it is a relief they could block it with their shield. They think cannot intervene in this fight unless it is that person. During their fight, Banshee calls Lycan miserable as he is a king, but he cannot become a king. Lycan asks what she means by that. But in the next moment, an incredible sound wave is heard. Those goblins wonder if their king is okay. Banshee hits Lycan with a sound wave, and he falls back. He looks around and finds that the wave has killed his goblins. He clenches his teeth and rushes towards her. She uses her sound power to push him away. He tightens his grip and swings his hammer to attack her, but she is fast enough to escape all his attacks. Lycan thinks that it was expected from Banshee. Her agility is so high that he ability to dodge is incredible. She is slowly getting the upper hand in this battle. Lycan starts breaking his chains in anger. Jack notices this and yells at Lycan to fight properly and protect the king. He takes the commands. He grabs his chain, swings it in the air, and catches Banshee with it. The chain is wrapped around her neck. He pulls the chain and throws her to the ground with a jerk. As she is lying on the ground, he tightens the grip of the chain around her neck. She cannot use her voice due to this. Lycan pulls the chain so hard that it breaks, killing her first. He asks her to pledge her loyalty to the king through death. The system announces that the hidden boss Banshee has been eliminated. After that, Lycan peeks at Hana. He starts walking towards her. 
Jack laughs in a distance and praises Lycan for his work. He orders him to kill all of them but to bring Choi Hana to him. She shoots bullets at him, but she is shocked to find that he is regenerating faster than damage is being done because of his high level. Lycan jumps towards her to crush her. Suddenly, Sia Jun comes there and cuts his arm with a single swing. Sang Su says that there has been a misunderstanding earlier. The real deal is over here. His friends are glad to see him here. While standing opposite Lycan, Sia Jun thinks he only wanted the Banshee to put some pressure on the goblins. Suddenly, the sickle of Banshee, which had drooped on the ground, caught Sia Jun's glance. He thinks it is beneficial. He calls Sang Su and says he is giving his cloak back. After throwing it at him, he rushes towards him to hit him. Lycan swings his one hand to keep him away. Then he throws a punch at him. Sia Jun blocks it using his gauntlets. Hana is stunned to see that and says that, considering Lycan has that kind of attack power, even when missing an arm, he is a true third goblin. Disu says they should leave this to Sia Jun and go and secure the dual contract. Sang Su tells them there is nothing to worry about if they discuss the dual contract. He opens his inventory. The others ask him what he is doing. He asks what they mean by that. He brings out some documents and says the paper is a dual contract. Jack is shocked to see this and wonders how he has his items. He asks him what he did to get them. Sang Su creates curiosity and asks if they want to know why his transaction is clean. It is because of his angel's earrings. All the lies spoken in front of the angel's earrings must be bared by the speaker. It means that Jack's inventory and his body are given to Sang Su. Sang Su shows him the contract and tells him that his body and inventory now belong to him, following his dirty dual contract. Now he is a slave to Sang Su. Jack irritatingly tells him not to kid with him. Sang Su tells him to look at the top of his head before speaking. Jack suddenly realizes that he is not wearing that goblin's headpiece. He is shocked to see that in Sang Su's hands. Sang Su laughs and says he knew Jack was controlling the goblins with this headpiece. Jack asks him how he knew that. Sang Su smirks and asks him what he should take next from him and shows him. Jack yells and orders the goblins to hurry and kill them. Ji Young tells Sang Su to hurry up and wear the headpiece to switch kings as the goblins approach them. Sang Su replies that it is impossible. Ji Young asks what he means by that. Sang Su explains that already existing goblins will keep following their original owner as long as they exist. They cannot betray him as their soul is tied to him. The goblins have approached them. Scared and blocking his attack, ji Yun asks what he should do now and if there is anything they can do. He replies that there is one way, they have to target the third goblin. Sia Jun is still fighting the goblin king. Lycan dodges his attack but Lycan's attacks are harming Sia Jun. After getting smashed into a wall Sia Jun clears his face and thinks he cannot fight the strongest boss monster yet. While thinking of a way to knock Lycan down, Sang Su tells him they have secured the headpiece. Sia Jun rushes and passes by Lycan, thinking that the third goblin was originally supposed to be the king of the goblins. He picks up the sickle of Banshee. The system informs him that the cries of the ghosts are released as soon as he acquires that weapon. Jack asks Sia Jun if he hopes to win with a Banshee's weapon. He commands the third goblin to get rid of Sia Jun quickly. Lycan takes the command of his master. He glowers and runs towards him. Sia Jun is ready to tackle him. But something glares in his eyes, and he uses his hammer to hit Sia Jun. The critical hit smashes him into the book rack. Sia Jun stabilized himself. He activates his dragon's eyes and finds Lycan's weak point. He can see the chains around him. He lifts the sickle and gets ready again. Lycan runs towards him, holding his hammer in his hand. This time, he blocks his attack using that sickle. But he realizes that the sickle is too heavy for him to use. He again gets smashed into the book rack. His dragon eyes are still activated. He thinks that it will be difficult to have a prolonged fight with this monster. It was expected that while fighting a D-rank boss, one must target that. He needs to aim for this one opportunity. He signals Hana, and she fires a bullet at Lycan. He tells her that she is doing something useless. Jack laughs and mocks them on their thinking. He tells Lycan to hurry up and kill them. Suddenly, his body starts moving without his control. It's Sang Su controlling the body of this imposter. He drags him in between Hana and Lycan. He does not know what is happening and tells Sang Su to stop it. Sia Jun tells him that he is trapped. He sees Sia Jun aiming for something but is unsure what he is doing. He orders Lycan to go and kill them. But he does not respond to him. He asks Lycan if he cannot hear him. 
Si Ajun tells him that the contract between those two has ended. He says he cut the link between the two he saw with his dragon eye. Jack is stunned to hear that. Suddenly, he felt a hand on his head. Lycan grabs him by his head and lights him up. Jack tells him to put him down. While holding him, Lycan recalls the time when he was chained. He says he swore loyalty to his king from birth as a goblin. If it was the king's order, he had to obey it. But he wonders why that expected loyalty is so painful and unpleasant. But this guy cannot be the king. He is crying the tears of blood. He refuses to obey him anymore. Disu notices the trembling in his hammer. In the next moment, all those first goblins bow before their true king. Siajun says that as a D-rank boss no longer bound by restriction, the rest of the goblins are suppressed just by hearing his sound. Jack says Lycan is so noisy and asks if he will not shut up. But Lycan throws him away, and he gets smashed. He rushes towards him, saying that he does not have the qualifications to be a king. He punches him and kills him. Then, he looks at Siajun. He smiles and tells him to stop saying they do not have a reason to fight. He is holding that goblin headpiece in his hands. Lycan says he will kill him. Siajun wears that headpiece. He has inherited the tight lecking of the headpiece. The system says Siajun can link the goblin's soul to his own. With that, Lycan is being chained again. He asks how a human dares to do this. Siajun tells him he has no ill will toward him, but he cannot let him go like this. Lycan is trying to free himself. His nerves are swelling and looks like they will burst. Ji Young is stunned to see that and asks what that arrow-like thing is that came flying suddenly. They think that the headpiece is not working. They wonder if that means they cannot control him, even with this item. Siajun activates the dragon's eye to find the reason. He finds that something is spreading through his body. Lycan is growing and growling like a beast. The immense sound of his scream is throwing everything away. He is grabbing the other goblins. Sang Su is wondering what it has become. Even Siajun is stunned to see his transformation. Sang Su stands up and says he can only pretend to laugh. Siajun notices that Lycan has even regenerated the arm he lost. Lycan slams on the floor. The force was so strong that Siajun fell back. Sang Su asks him how Lycan is so strong. Siajun tells him not to get distracted and look over there. Lycan has grabbed Jack, who is hardly breathing and coughing because of injuries he got. It seems to Sang Su that Lycan was after Jack from the start. But he is shocked to see what happens next. Lycan is about to eat Jack. Everyone wonders what he is doing. Jack is still coughing and says this serves them right. They will not be able to make it out. Lycan tears his flesh and his blood falls everywhere. Siajun is just looking at the beast that has just appeared. Sang Su asks him what this is. Suddenly, the system starts giving an alert. Then, the train starts shaking. The system informs that a bug has occurred and the system is still checking the status of the bug. The vibration is so strong that they all tumble over. Lycan has become huge and has broken the roof of the cabin. Siagun is looking at that massive monster and realizes that the real king of the goblins might have just appeared. The system has ranked this monster as C-ranked but has not given a name yet. In the storage compartment, two men wearing masks are looking at all the stuff in the storage. They will easily get through a week with this much staff. The big guy is happy with the situation and says they should take it in their inventories. The subordinate takes the order. They both are National Intelligence Service members. The boss, Kim Gapsu, mentions that there are no goblins for some reason, so the task is easy. The little panda guy, Yu Yonsiak, says that one never knows when they might appear, so they should hurry up because Ark is currently in a crisis. Kim Gapsu tells him to hurry up and leave. Suddenly, Yon Siak calls Gapsu to come over there as he wants to show something. He has found the people in the storage compartment. Gapsu is stunned to see the human trafficking happening there. But he says that they will leave them and return to the Ark. Yon Siak is surprised to hear that from him. Gapsu explains that they cannot take all these people back to the Ark. They will just take the food and leave. Suddenly, the cabin's roof starts cracking, and it breaks completely. Lycan appears there and looks at Gapsu. Gapsu wonders what this is. Lycan starts punching on that cabin. Ji Young and others are watching him from a distance. Ji Young notices that Lycan is paying no mind to them. Sia Jun says it appears that Lycan has evolved. Ji Young asks to explain. Sia Jun says that according to the system message, Lycan is C-ranked. Disu asks if it can evolve into a boss monster without a dungeon break. Sia Jun replies that it is possible theoretically. 
However, it has probably never happened in Dream Side 1. Siyajun thinks that there is no common sense here. The system recognized it as a bug. It is obvious that it became like the trigger. Like an evolved, but he lost his rationality. He only moves for his desire, and that desire is to become stronger. Therefore, he is eating the living beings, whether humans or goblins. Hana asks what they should do in this situation. Siyajun replies that it probably is not a complete evolution. It is hard to call Lycan the C-rank evolution monster Chimamirio, which Siyajun knows. He recalls that the virus that causes dungeon sickness and elicits the development of greed and triggers is called the Poja virus. In Dream Side 1, they were researching how to evolve monsters using Poja virus, but to no avail. However, this is the second world. It could be that a variable that was not in the first world has been applied to him here. Siyajun takes off that headpiece and activates the dragon's eye skill. He sees a light emerging from Lycan's neck and says that strange energy is suspicious. Jiyun says that in his opinion, it is too much for them to target something of that size. He replies that it is not true. There is still a way. He equips with the gauntlet and cuts the palm of his left hand with it. The others are shocked and wonder what he is doing. The blood is dripping from his hand. He wears that headpiece and drops his blood on it. With that, he activates the unique skill Chimamorio. It starts bringing some changes to Siyajun's body. Some souls appear around him as well. Sangsu is excited to see a real Chimamorio. Siyajun says that to catch a beast, he must become one. The system notifies that he can control the souls of the Chimamorio. The degree of strength is decided by how many souls he uses. Siyajun wonders if this is what it feels like to fight with souls coiling around him. He can see the faces of all those people to whom those souls belong. He sees some children and thinks they must be among these souls. He opens his inventory and summons Vindisi's Blade of Regret. He was expecting this. In the Chimamorio state, he can use this blade. On top of that, it is a sword used by the undead. The Vendisi's Blade of Regret resonates sharply. Diso comes close and asks if he is okay. Siyajun tells him to stand back. Otherwise, their souls might be absorbed as well. Then, he rushes towards Lycan. He peeks at him. He thinks that the level of the Chimamorio changes based on how many souls he is using. Lycan is in a state where he absorbed countless goblin souls. However, he gathered the souls forcefully. An actual Chimamorio is formed with a soul-binding item like the goblin headpiece. He is confident that he will end this in no time. He rushes towards Lycan and gives him a slash on his arm. With that, his hand is cut from his arm and falls off the train. But with that attack, Siyajun's hand starts shaking as well. He says that he has to find out Lycan's weakness quickly. Gapsu and Yon Siak watch Siyajun standing on the roof and ask if he is a human. While fighting, he tells them to leave if they do not want to die. Yon Siak warns him to watch back. Lycan is about to eat him. But he has escaped his bite. Siyajun asks if he wants to eat him. He says that he has a lot of souls with him, so Lycan probably wants to eat him. Lycan is again about to grab him with his hand, but he dodges it. It is sure now that Lycan does not have the intelligence. After landing at a distance, he activates the dragon's eye and again finds that energy emerging from his neck. He thinks that the cause of his wilderness seems to the, the edge of his neck, so he rushes to attack there. While dodging his attacks, he jumps on his arm. There, he activates the magic concentration skill and slashes the back of his neck with all his power. When he looks at the cut he gave him, he is surprised to find a dungeon flower. It is shocking to see that someone has planned a dungeon flower inside a monster. But that is not an ordinary dungeon flower. It is mixed with the Poja virus that accelerated ontogeny development. He is sure that those persistent company guys are behind this, but he now knows what he must aim for. He jumps off the train as well. He gives gashes above his ankles so that Lycan falls on his knees and stops moving around. He again aims for his neck. After activating the magic concentration skill, he jumps to make the final attack. But the needle-like bodies grow around the neck and cause puncture wounds on Siyajun's body. He solids his grip around his sword and activates the ice needle skill to pierce through his body. Siyajun cannot maintain Chimamorio any longer as it is too much to take for him. He needs to end this battle with a last attack. He cuts all those thrones around the wound. But still, he could not reach the dungeon flower. He is lacking strength as well. Suddenly, Hana tells him to stop moving. She shoots that part of Lycan's neck using his burn blood skill. The bullet pierces through that flower. 
The system removes the effect of Chimamoro's skill from Siajun's body. After that, the system activates his skill of danger detection. He observes that all the souls are leaving Lycan's body. Hana is observing those souls getting out as well. Siajun wonders if those souls are flooding out because they lost the pivot point. He was planning on attacking the source so Lycan could not use the souls to power his strength, but he did not see this coming. If it is left like this, the souls in the area will flood out. He knows that the dead attack the living instinctively. This means these souls will find a vessel to possess, leading to a massacre. There is not much time left. He has to control the souls. He remembers that he used too much strength in the previous fight, and he is not a goblin in the first place. But there is another method. He looks at Lycan, who has come to his original form and is lying in front of him half dead. He knows that goblins can have control over souls. The goblin headpiece is the original equipment to evolve a goblin into a Chimamorio. He takes off the headpiece and plans to hand it over to Lycan. He knows it is a gamble, but has no other way. If Lycan becomes a full Chimamorio, Siajun cannot stop him. Still, he places the headpiece on Lycan's head and tells him that he has to become king for a bit. He says he is leaving it to him and requests that he put those souls to sleep. In his unconscious, Lyka hears some sounds and sees some bodies, he recognizes them. They are goblins. Those voices cursed him and complained about how he could eat his kind. Lycan recalls that he ate all those souls just to become stronger. He also hears a strange voice that tells him to hurry up and you the goblin headpiece to seal them. Lycan is drowned deep in his thoughts. He thinks goblins, the closest thing to a half-god NPC, send wandering souls to the afterlife. However, because of their sin of eating their kid to become stronger, the power of the goblin headpiece was sealed, and their race became nothing more than regular monsters. Those souls are haunting him. Some want him to save them. Some are cursing him. He is getting mad. He keeps saying that it is not his fault and it is not what he wanted. He requests them to leave him alone. He screams and says he does not have the desire to live. But he hears that strange voice again, telling him he is leaving this task to him. The voice is requesting him to put these souls to sleep. He wonders whose voice this is. He is trying to recognize the person holding that goblin headpiece. Then he recalls that the person found the true appearance of the goblin headpiece and became a Chimamorio to stop him. His mind is clear now. He knows that the person is the true owner of the goblin headpiece. Lycan takes the headpieces and accepts his king's command. Inside the passenger cabin, Gapsu and Yon Siak are running away. While running, Gapsu wonders what was in the words earlier. Yon Siak asks what he thinks it was. He replies it was a monster. It was like the C-rank boss, Lizard King. On top of that, there were two of them. Yon Siak asks him what they should do now. They have lost contact with Siaku and Jihun. Gapsu stops for a while. Yon Siak asks him what the matter is. Gapsu is still wondering about Siajun. He starts walking again and says they are returning to the Ark. Yon Siak is shocked to hear that. Gapsu says he is sorry to them, but they must leave them. Yo Siak shockingly asks if they at least should not make sure they are alive. Gapsu answers, yelling that Yon Siak saw that scene too. That place has already become hell. He tells him to hurry up. They are returning. If they stay in this dungeon, they will die. Suddenly, the roof of this cabin starts crumbling. It falls on them all of a sudden. Gapsu wonders if that could be those monsters again. He cannot see Yon Siak due to the dust and asks by calling his name if he is okay. He tells him that they are going to escape quickly. Yon Siak is all good. He tells Gapsu to look over there. It's Siajun who has fallen from the roof. They cannot see him clearly from the distance, but they are sure it is a person. Gapsu tells him to see if it is one of their agents. But when he is about to move forward, something stops his way. It tells him to stand back. They both get scared to see a monster. But when they look closely, a baby monster warns them not to come any closer. They both wonder what that small thing is. It looks like a goblin. That little goblin looks like Lycan, and it falls back. He stands up again and tells them, yelling to stay away. In another compartment, Jack appears. He is injured, but he is alive. He is still stunned by that monstrous power. He wonders if Lycan did not have enough souls as it was rendered helpless. He does not know who was behind that, but he decides to kill him with his bare hands. He says he will show him the true strength of the company. Suddenly, he hears someone calling who is deciding this. Jack takes out his sword and asks who he is, but he cannot see anyone around. 
Suddenly, his body is controlled by someone, and he makes him kneel. Sang Su appears there and says it is nice to meet his slave number one. Jack tries to lift his head. Sang Su warns him not to do anything stupid. He tells him that he will not be able to die so easily until he pays back all his debts. Jack clenches his teeth and asks who he is and why he is doing this to him, someone who is a member of the company. Sang Su thinks and says what he should answer. Then he giggles and says that he is a much more vicious merchant than Jack. The souls trap Sia Jun and they haunt him. He is sure that at this rate he will be eaten by the souls. The souls are requesting him to save them. Suddenly, he opens his eyes and looks traumatized. The little goblin calls him his king and asks if he has come back to his senses. He was giving cold water sponging therapy to Sia Jun when he was unconscious. He is emotional to see Sia Jun coming back to his senses. Sia Jun wonders if this is the third goblin. The system informs him that he has obtained the title King of the Goblins. The goblins bow their heads to him. Sia Jun asks his friends if he slept for two days. Hana is glad to see him woken up. Lycan sees Gorong and asks him who he is. They both are on his bed. Hana informs him about the situation. He is surprised to hear about the National Intelligence Service in the Ark and asks if the government is still alive. She says that this is what they are saying. Sangsu has gone to the Ark to negotiate. He asks what is negotiating about. She replies that the situation in the Ark seems to be bad, so they are looking for a lot of stuff. She thinks it is because the Lizardmen are blocking all the land routes. If the Lizardmen dungeon has not been cleared even once since it opened, it is probably a high-ranked dungeon by now. Sia Jun says that if they form an army, it would probably surpass a C-ranked dungeon. Suddenly, he remembers the survivors and asks what happened to them. She replies that they found Gong Ji Won to be one of the survivors. But his condition was really bad. He is in critical condition, so Disu accompanies him to an arc with a doctor. The remaining survivors remain in this dungeon because they have no rooms. Lycan interrupts them and asks his king to give him an order. Sia Jun asks him if the children's souls have gone extinct. He replies no. He says that all the souls he wanted have been preserved. Sia Jun is surprised to hear that. He asks if they can return the souls of the kids. Lycan replies that picking specific souls held within the goblin headpiece is impossible. The goblin headpiece does not belong to him anymore. Until the die Sia Jun dies, the goblin headpiece is his. Sia Jun thinks that it does not make sense for a monster like Lycan to have a white name. He says that it appears that Lycan has lost all his strength by putting the souls to sleep, so lending him the headpiece will be useless. He asks him if there is no other method. He replies that Sia Jun needs to acquire more of King's dignity. He asks what is King's dignity. Sang Su enters the room, saying that he knows about that. He has returned from the Ark. Sia Jun asks if Disu has returned too. He replies he has not. Disu said he would stay in the Ark for a bit longer because Gong Jiwon's condition is extremely bad. Suddenly, Sia Jun notices Jek with Sang Su carrying his luggage. He asks how that guy is still alive. It appears that Sang Su has tangled him up with the angel's earrings. Sang Su hits Jek's head and says it is true. This guy gave him a very vicious contract. Sia Jun realizes that Jack's transactions are clean for a reason. Due to the angel's earrings, neither the contractor nor the contractee can lie to each other. Due to this item, all lies said in front of the angel's earrings will be borne by the liar. Sia Jun says that is weird and asks how Sang Su scammed him when he had the angel's earrings. Sang Su laughs and says that was before the service outage. Sia Jun asks him if he found out anything about Jack. He replies that he could not. Unfortunately, his memory was erased. The company must have used some sort of device. Jack rolls his eyes, so Sang Su adds more weight on him as a punishment. Sia Jun asks him what he knows about the king's dignity. He replies that Sia Jun needs a goblin's horn. Goblins control souls with their horns. He happens to know the location of an item that uses it as a material. The National Intelligence Service made an official cooperation request. It is a place not far from here, in an area called Bermuda. Hana is surprised to hear about that place. Sang Su says that a team that went exploring there went missing. The team leader who sent a distress signal is Captain Kim Kang Rol. The last message he sent is important. The message consisted of three phrases, danger, high level, and goblin orb. The Bermuda area is a place related to goblins. The National Intelligence Service requested an investigation. 
Siajun says that if they obtain the goblin orb, will they be able to return the children's souls? Lycan says the king's dignity will be more pronounced if it is made with a goblin's horn. Siajun does not know the king's dignity, but he is sure of one thing. He can become even stronger now. He checks his stats. His level has gone up a lot. He targeted a D-rank dungeon, so it is a given. With this, even if he cannot use Chimamorio, he can use Vindisi's Blade of Regret. He decides to go to Bermuda and asks where this area is. Sang Su replies that it is in Jamsil. All the rides are still at the Lot World, and it seems dead. Two players are standing at a door and signal their captain to hurry up and come there. Captain Kim Kangrol is running away from the Lizardmen. He wonders how this can be, Lizardmen only in the Ark are here. There was not even a dungeon break. On top of that, the boss monster and the goblins are there too. There are too many different kinds of monsters here. As Kim Kangrel enters that room, those players shut the door. The boy asks the captain if he is okay. The captain asks him about the name of that item. He unbelievably asks if he is talking about the goblin's orb. He says that he has seen it once in the dream side one. The captain recipes that it has something to do with this situation. He is sure that there is no way for monsters to carry around equipment unrelated to their strengths. The boy shockingly asks how he can be worried about that item when their lives are in danger. He requests him to think about getting back safely. The captain tells him not to worry and says they will go back. They have to go back. He says this is a trap. They need to make sure nobody comes here. Siu Jun and the others come out of the moving dungeon. Sang Su's waves goodbye to them and says he will be waiting for them on the subway. Siu Jun tells him to take good care of the kids and the rest. He is lending this dungeon to him, so he must not use it recklessly. Sang Su laughs and says he will take care of it, so they need not worry about that. Siu Jun and Hana look at him suspiciously and say they can't help but worry. Siu Jun peeks at Lycan and thinks that the boss of this mobile dungeon is still the third goblin. However, since the third goblin is with him, the authority of this mobile dungeon is in his hands. It would be better to clarify this. Hana uses her mobile torch to lighten up the way. She says that there are no traces of people or monsters. Ji Young says that this is why it feels even more eerie. She asks if it is so. She is feeling a bit excited to visit Lot World. Ji Young is surprised and asks if this is her first time at Lot World. She replies that she debuted at such a young age, so she never even dreamed of going to many places. In addition to that, she has not had any events there. Siu Jun looks at her and thinks that he almost forgot about that. Choi Hana is well known to everyone in South Korea. She really is an idol. White talking, they reach the Lot world. Ji Young is ahead of them. Hana tells Siu Jun to come quickly. She is excited to go inside. Siu Jin noticed the environment and said it was strange, it was so clean and well organized. He wonders if no one has really come to such a big place since that day. After entering the Lot world, Hana looks so happy. He is amazed by seeing such an incredibly spacious place. Siu Jun feels awkward seeing her like this. But still, it feels good to him to return to his normal daily life after such a long time. Suddenly, they hear a terrifying scream. They get alert and wonder what that sound is. He activates his dragon's eye and detects a mysterious energy wave around them. All of a sudden, the rides around them start playing by themselves. They are shocked to see that. Siu Jun alerts them to prepare. All of them prepare their weapons. Siu Jun can feel that a massive horde is coming. Suddenly, they see that place filled with people. Even the mics are working and welcoming the guests to this happy fairy teal land that is filled with dreams and romance. Siu Jun is stunned and says this cannot be real. Hana asks him what is happening there. He replies he does not know. Some fans recognize Choi Hana. They say that she is even more amazing in person. She is catching attention. Some think that she is here to film a project. She asks Siu Jun what to do. He replies that he does not know what is happening, but they must get out of there first. He uses smoke grenades to distract people and escape from there. Siu Jun says that they are getting too much attention. Hana says that their attire seems too conspicuous. Siu Jun thinks that they should find a place to change their outfits. They find a shop that looks good. They change their clothes. Hana is wearing a uniform. It has been 10 years since she wore a school uniform. Siu Jun agrees with her. He asks Lycan if he has hidden his horn well. He replies yes. He has covered it with a handkerchief. Ji Young smirked and said he would just go as he was. Siu Jun asks him if it is okay if he does not change clothes. 
He giggles and says it is. He has always liked attention. Siya Jun says that it is obvious. Hana asks them if they are all ready. Ji Young looks at her and says her appearance is ineffective in hiding her. She agrees and says people can recognize her just by her face. They all start exploring the place in earnest. Siya Jun looks around suspiciously. Lycan looks at a tower and asks his lord what that tall tower is for. He wonders if humans are genuinely such great beings. Siya Jun sits on a bench and sighs. He had not realized that the Lot world was this vast. Hana is sitting beside him. She says that it feels like nothing has happened at all. With this continuous music playing and the crowd's clamor, it is almost as if everything that happened before was a dream, and this is like the actual reality. He puts a ticket before her. She asks what it is. He says it is the Lot World's ticket he picked up earlier. But the issue date is from the last year. She shockingly asks if that means they have time traveled. He replies no and tells her to look at her phone. They did not travel through time. This entire area seems to be showing a specific moment from the past. It is an illusion. The wind was blowing and she was trying to prevent her hat from flying away. She looks up and says that it is disappointing that they would all disappear. She calls him. When he looks at her, she clicks a selfie. She looks at the picture and says it came out well. He asks her what that is all of a sudden. She says that if it is an illusion, it is so beautiful. So she thought that taking one photo would be fine. He looks at her and wonders if Hana's proper form as Marksman Clark or as an idol. He cannot even tell which is real now. Suddenly, people recognize her even when their clothes have changed. Seeing a guy with her, they think she is in a secret relationship. Sia Jun is embarrassed as well, as they are drawing attention once again. They decide to run away from there. Ji Yun and Lycan are also trapped in the crowd. They come running and join them. Sia Jun says they have to get out of there. Hana asks what they should do now. He says that first, they have to investigate the root cause behind this deceptive charade diligently. While sitting in a bucket of the wheel, Sojourn tells them this place is not a dungeon. The other two are stunned to hear that. Hana asks what this is then if it is not an unfinished dungeon. He replies that he thought so too, but he has not received any dungeon entry message since coming here. They both realize that and agree with him. Hana again asks what that place is then. Sia Jun looks down and thinks that he has told them that this is not a dungeon, but he wonders how else he can explain all of this. Above all, Gorong cannot help but drool at the fantastic scent emanating from all around. Gorong cheers for the sumptuous feast nearby. Gorong drooling like this means something is wrong. He has no idea why this scent is coming from all directions. This is starting to give him a headache. Ji Yong is disappointed to hear that they have to search again. Hana says that they did not find anything during the previous search. Sia Jun says that they will try a different approach this time. They will use Choi Hana. They come to the stage. She asks him if he really thinks they should perform. He says yes as it seems like the best idea for now. He adds that when they were searching this place earlier, he noticed several strange currents, but they disappeared as soon as they approached them. So what they will do is try to draw those currents out to them instead. She asks if this method will work. He replies that they do not have other options. Ji Young comes there and says that they have set up the stage. Sia Jun appreciates their work. Hana says that if they will perform, they must make it convincing. She says that even though it is an illusion, the people here believe that this is still reality. After a while, the stage opens. People there wonder what is happening and what kind of performance this is. They suddenly recognize Choi Hana's song, Festival. They cannot believe that Choi Hana has come to the park. Hana put on her concert dress and appeared on the stage. She holds the mic, greets everybody, and says it is time to dance since this is the time for a festival. People are excited to see her as she is really there. She is gathering them and making them dance to her beats. Sia Jun and Ji Young are looking at her from a distance. Ji Young is enjoying himself as well. Sia Jun has activated her dragon's eye and wonders if should join in too. He cannot let Hana do all the work. Suddenly, he finds that energy appearing there. It is flowing around those mascots and he wonders what is the matter with them. He recalls that they appeared when they first arrived and then on the carousel. Anytime Hana started gathering an audience, they appeared. He speaks in the speaker that the guests have to ride the rides. Hana looks at him suspiciously. Those mascots are carrying weapons. They repeat that line and launch an attack at her. But Sia Jun appears in between and kicks that mascot away. He tells them not to disrupt the performance. The other one in a bear costume comes on the stage. 
Suddenly, the speakers start playing that line to welcome people there. With that, people start disappearing. The speaker says that the nighttime operation is beginning. Siu Jun and others are shocked. She says that people and the audience have disappeared. Ji Young points in a direction and alerts them of the danger coming from there. They are the monsters of many kinds. Siu Jun is equipped with his weapon and slashes one of them. He tells his fellows to stay alert. The speakers are still making announcements. They call it a monster party theme and wish them a fun day. Siu Jun looks around and wonders if this is not a dungeon. There must be another reason for this situation. He activates the dragon's eye and finds a bunny mascot at a distance, holding a black orb in his hands. He sees the reason for these events, he runs that way. But that bunny starts running away, he chases him. The others are fighting the monsters as well. Hana says there are too many. Siu Jun looks around to find that bunny. It seems he is playing tricks on Siu Jun. At the entrance of Ark, the guards are doing their duty at night. Suddenly, they see someone coming and become alert. They ask him to show his identity. He is the player Kim Hoon. He is in a bad condition. He raises his hands and says that he is a team member of Captain Kim Kangriol's unit. He tells the guard to connect him to Captain Na Hansiak. There is something urgent he needs to report. Hansiak is shocked to find that Kim Hoon survived in the Bermuda Zone. He asks how he came back and where the other players are. Kim Hoon replies that he has spatial teleportation skills, so he managed to escape. The others are still stranded. As expected, Lote World, known as the Bermuda Zone, is believed to be a massive trap. At this point, they have discovered signs of the dungeon, but its rating is at least D level. It might even be C level. He says that they need support and high level players should not enter there. Hansiak is shocked to hear that. He asks what he means by that. Kim Hoon replies that he does not have all the details, but the unique circumstances there seem to be linked to memory. For high-level players, memories could be a curse. He asks the captain if he is listening. Hansiak replies that this is a significant issue. They have already dispatched a support team. About an hour ago, outside Lot World, a company-affiliated Break 3 team was surveying the area. Their captain, Yoon Byingu, says that it appears this place has not transformed into a dungeon. A subordinate agrees with him, saying that most dungeons begin as landmarks. Byingu says that it is not an absolute rule. He asks if it is confirmed that K is headed in this direction. The other guy replies yes. He says that K forcibly commandeered the running ghost train and came here. Byingu says he has no idea what he is planning. This place is called the Bermuda Zone. His subordinates ask if he is referring to the area of mysterious disappearances. He says that nothing about the Bermuda Zone has been revealed yet. No one who went there has come back alive. His fellows are terrified after hearing that. He says that Kay has ventured into such a place, so he must know something. The Bermuda Zone was also a scenario in Dream Side 1. Perhaps it is a location where the source of the immensely powerful force he possesses is hidden. He says whatever is inside, they must protect it from K without allowing it to be seized, so they run towards the entrance. As they enter, they are surprised to see people there. They wonder what this is. Children are playing all over the place. Bayangu looks around and asks what exactly this is, and if this is real. He does not get this place. But more importantly, he thinks that the buildings outside Lot World were undeniably decrepit structures they passed by earlier. But now they appear completely intact, as if Dream Side 2 is about to unfold. He tells his comrades to listen up closely. They will assess the situation first and ask them to follow him. They take his orders. People there look at them and wonder if there is an event today, as it seems they are doing cosplay. Byungo thinks it is unbelievable. No matter how many times he sees it, he cannot believe it is reality. Suddenly, they hear the sound of a song. He wonders if this is Choi Hana's song. It sounds like a live performance. He wonders if she is really performing. Now he thinks about that, he recalls that Hana is with Kay. He orders his men to head towards the stage, but in the next moment, the scene changes and shifts to night. He looks at the sky and thinks the surprises have no end. He is sure that something strange is definitely happening here. He asks his men if they are all right. Suddenly, the monsters attack them. He dodges the first attack. Then he grabs his weapon and kills that monster. He asks what these monsters are. He tells others to prepare for battle and attack all the monsters. Suddenly, he sees something unbelievable. He sees Kay and asks him how he is here. Hana is firing at the monsters. 
Lycan says that he has to be of service to the king. But suddenly, he sees something. This is a goblin. He tells him that it must be audacious for him to oppose the kind. Then he rushes and attacks him, but that goblin grabs him and throws him away. Lycan falls to the ground. He says that it is unbelievable that a mere goblin defeats him. The goblin is about to crush him. But ji Young comes there, lifts him and runs away. Lycan tells him to let him go. He must be the one to kill that fiend. Ji Young tells him to stop it as he does not even stand a chance right now. Lycan says it is preposterous. He wonders how he, a third goblin, can lose to this simple goblin. Ji Young says they must get out of there first. Lycan tells him not to be sneaky. Suddenly, a massive monster appears in their way. Ji Young tells Lycan to show his worth now. He is speechless. But Hana shoots a bullet at him and kills the monster. They take a sigh when he falls. She asks Ji Young if he is hurt. Before Ji Yog says something, Lycan says that they should run. Ji Young asks him what he says. Lycan says that he does not feel the power he once had. He is weak now. He thinks that all his power was perhaps drained from controlling souls. But he has no regrets. It was his king's command after all. Ji Young asks where they should run to. Lycan says they must run to the king. They stopped when they saw Kay in front of him. Ji Young is stunned to see him transformed into this pathetic form. Lycan cannot recognize him as well. Ji Young says that with this form, they can easily sweep away Th said his monsters. But K launches an attack on them, which they barely dodge. Ji Young asks him what is wrong with him. Lycan says that his aura is different. Ji Young asks K if he did something wrong, or if it is because of that past incident. Suddenly, Sia Jun comes in between them and blocks K's attack. He tells them to stay back. He asks them if they are okay. Lycan is confused about how there are two kings. Sia Jun tells Lycan to look closely and asks who the real king is. He activates his title of King of Goblins. He recognizes his majesty and asks who the other one is. Sia Jun replies that he does not know who he is. He tells them to get ready. He will blast through in one shot. He uses his dragon's eye skill and finds an opening. As that fake runs towards him to attack, Sia Jun uses the cold breath skill and gets rid of him by breaking that imposter into pieces. After that, they all hide somewhere. Sia Jun says that they should be fine for a while. Ji Young is not well because of the sudden nightfall and tea appearance of the monsters. Hana tells him that this form suits him better. She asks if that imposter is Sia Jun as well. Sia Jun replies that it was definitely him. He thinks and says it might be because of that item. She asks what he means by that. He tells them that the mysterious flow permeating through Lot Worlds originated from the item that the rabbit mask had. He is sure that the item is definitely the Goblin Orb. She asks if they have to capture Rabbit Mash and get the Goblin Orb. He does not answer that. He says the monsters might be tangible illusions, like the people they saw during the daytime. The reason the monsters appear is probably related to memory. Ji Young asks him to explain. Sia Jun says he has not transformed into this state since the running ghost train. So nobody here knows about or can replicate his transformed state. However, they still remember it. If that item can interfere with their memories, then it is possible. He thinks that out of countless memories, choosing this form indicates another condition. He asks them how they all feel about his transformation into that state. They both were not imaging that question to appear. Ji Young pretends that it is inspiring. Hana says that it is impressive, but a bit scary though. This gives birth to a thought in his mind. He gets the point. It is about common emotions that are easy to manifest. That emotion is fear. He thinks everyone has different sources of fear, hence the variety of monsters. It was from Lycan's memory, a subject of his fear. He stops for a minute to think. He says that if the monster he is afraid of appears, what would it be? He knows the answer. In the S-rank dungeon, the dragon's tomb. Hana and Ji Young ask if this is happening because of their fears. Sia Jun replies yes, he says that Captain Kim Kangriol must be in this lot world. In addition to that, they need to find the goblin orb. So to summarize they need to find two things. Suddenly, the earth starts shaking and something comes out of it. Sia Jun looks to find what that is. It is a red centipede. Sia Jun and Hana are not afraid of it, but Ji Young starts screaming, seeing that monster. Sia Jun looks at him and wonders if this is what Ji Yun is afraid of. He signals Hana. She says she is ready and asks what its weak point is. He tells her to aim for the roof of the centipede's mouth. She moves forward and shoots at his mouth. 
those bullets pierce through his mouth and make big holes there. With that, the centipede digs back into the earth. Siyajun sits near Jian and asks if he is okay. His voice is shaking. He normalizes his breath and says that when he was little, his father would punish him by locking him inside of a box. There were always centipedes inside it. Siyajun feels sorry for him. He thought Jiyong would be afraid of it simply because of his wealthy background. Suddenly, Hana alerts him and tells him to look outside. She says that because of all of this commotion, a horde of monsters is heading this way. Siyajun tells everyone to ready their weapons. Jiyoung notices that there is one behind them as well. He is a noble NPC Norhan. Siyajun wonders why an NPC is here. Han says it is her fault. It is a character she hates because it resembles a stalker who used to follow her around. It appears to him it is not just monsters that appear. Norhan prepares his weapon. Siyajun rushes towards him, telling others that he will take care of him. He knows that the level of that guy is above 200. He launches an attack on him, but Norhan blocks it and pushes him back. Both keep this game of attacking and dodging going on for a while. Siyajun notices that Norhan is not as strong as a true level 200 player. Norhan runs towards him and tries to stab him. Siyajun sits down to escape. He looks at him and thinks that he cannot say for sure that he will not lose from Norhan. He tackles him and his sword falls down. Siyajun realizes that he was wrong earlier. Norhan is like everyone else. He slashes him and kills him. He tells others that must hurry. Hana notices something up and asks Siyajun to look up there. He is surprised to see that rabbit mask holding the goblin orb and standing on a tower. He says that he will not let him escape this time. He uses the magic concentration skill to jump in the air. Seeing him up in the air, the rabbit mascot runs away. Siyajun lands on the tower and chases him. He tries to throw a punch, but the rabbit predicts it and dodges it. He throws that orb down. Siyajun tells Jiyoung to catch it. He runs there and almost catches it. But suddenly, the bear mascot comes there and snatches that orb. After that, he runs away. Siyajun runs alongside him on the roofs of those buildings and wonders what those mascots are. Suddenly, the system warns him that a danger has been detected. The building he was running on collapses. Siyajun realizes that his fear has shown up just as he expected. It is the level 500 owner of that S-ranked dungeon, Kamushi. Somewhere in the world, a joker laughs and notices the arrival of an unwelcomed guest. Siyajun looks at Kamushi and wonders why it had to be here. He calls Hana and Jiyang. Jiyoung asks him what he has summoned. Siyajun says he will buy them sometime. They must escape from here in the meantime. They ask what about him. He replies he may not be able to knock him down, but he can at least hold him. Hana alerts him that Kamushi is behind him and is about to attack. Siyajun turns his head back to see. He jumps and escapes the attack. The attack was so intense that it shook the ground. The others had to run as well. Hana tells Jiyoung to pull himself together. He asks her what just happened so suddenly. But they get shocked when they look up there and see the real K. Siyajun wonders if it is him. K is opposite the Kamushi. Both rivals are ready to fight each other. Kamushi shoots an energy beam from his mouth at K, but he jumps away and dodges. K is observing his movements. He uses his supercharged skills and launches an attack on Kamushi's face. Siyaju and others stand aside and watch the fight. Jiyoung asks if K is the reincarnation of the king. He wonders why K is here. Siyajun replies that K must have been summoned by someone who was afraid of K. Fortunately, it seems Kamushi is not unleashing his full power. Jiyoung is surprised to know that this is not his original power. Siyajun says that if he truly faced Kamushi, his gaze alone would have knocked him out. But Siyajun observes that still, his traits remain the same. An inextinguishable flame of death, a black flame. He ponders if they are facing the dragon clan. They need weapons made from dragon material. That trait must remain the same as well. But K currently does not have a dragon weapon. He looks at the battle and says K will lose. He recalls that he had already been killed by this monster once before because he did not have weapons made from dragon material. But even if K cannot win this fight, he can still buy them enough time. Siyajun starts running and says that they should start searching for the goblin's orb while K is holding Kamushi back. While running he thinks that this is their chance and they must use it. The monsters appear in their way but he keeps killing them and moving forward. He warns others to be cautious of the monsters around them. Hana notices something and alerts Siyajun. 
It is Xia Jun's evil form that HNA is afraid of. Xia Jun says that this is not the only thing to worry about. Kamushi and Kei are causing a commotion. The earth starts shaking. It means they are headed this way. The next moment, all the monsters gather there and surround them. Xia Jun observes that the evil copy of his have gotten bigger than before, like he has been eating souls. Hana says that it is time to see how strong Xia Jun is. He wonders what she is saying. She says that it is Chimamorio. Ji Young agrees with Hana and says it is time for Xia Jun to play Mirror Ball. Lycan also wants to see his true strength. Xia Jun realizes that he is in trouble because imagination is a soul consuming skill. It could even consume the souls of children. The monsters start walking towards them. Hana says they must decide something quickly. Xia Jun tries to find another way. But when he realizes there's no other way, he tells everyone to fight back. But as soon as they launch the counterattack, a dazzling car headlight strikes their eyes. The light is coming from a jeep that is heading this way. It hits the monsters in its way and stops near Xia Jun. He wonders whose car this is. But then he becomes glad when he sees the person inside. It is Captain Kim Kangriul. He tells them to get in the car quickly. After getting inside, they take a sigh of relief. The captain introduces himself to others. Xia Jun thanks him for saving their lives. The captain replies that he is glad he was not late. Xia Jun asks if he scared away the monsters with these headlights. He replies that Xia Jun is quick on the trigger. The monsters are weak to light but only to sunlight. He adds that he could not find them in the daytime to use it to their advantage. The headlights keep the monsters away and they pass safely. He says that he was surprised to encounter them first. He says that he could not sleep the first night here and was up all night waiting for help. Suddenly, a sword pierces throws the roof of the cabin and tries to stab them. Xia Jun says that it appears some monsters can survive in the sun. He looks in the mirror and finds that it is his evil copy, clinging to the roof. Xia Jun is now angry because this guy is following them like a dog. The captain applies the hand brakes to throw the evil one, but he grabs his sword and the roof tightly and stabilizes himself there. He starts stabbing furiously. Ji Young gets hurt with one of the attacks. Hana asks him if he is okay. She aims for that guy and shoots from inside. The bullet pierces through his body, yet he is not hurt that much. She finds that even though he is just a clone, he can withstand such hits. Xia Jun is now fed up. He opens the door and jumps on the car's roof. The clone tries to slash him, but he dodges it. He grabs him by his arm, lifts him up, and smashes him to the bonnet. The clone is awestruck. Xia Jun smashes his head down. Then he lifts it up and tells him that he is sick of him and he must go away. He takes his face in front of those headlights. That light starts killing him and he fades away. A screen appears before Xia Jun and he captures that aura in it. He sits on the bonnet and tells the captain to drive. They will go to the hideout. At the hideout, there are team members of Captain Kim Kangriol. Some of them are injured as well. They see the captain first and then Choi Hana. They run towards her, ignoring the captain completely. They ask her if she is okay and give her a potion. The captain disappointingly asks them if they do not care about him. One replies in embarrassment that they do and says that he is glad the captain is okay. They return to Choi Hana and ask her how she ended up here. Ji Young feels hurt as he is being ignored. The captain asks him if none of them realize there is an S-class monster outside. They are shocked to hear that. He adds that Kay and his clone are fighting like madmen outside. He sees their shocking reaction and says it is true. Kay is here right now. Xia Jun realizes that these people are mistaking the clone for the real Kay. They do not know who Choi Hana is, but it is not essential. Kangriel asks why those guys are acting like this. They must go outside and help Kay. They have to attack the dungeon now. Hearing about the dungeon shocks Xia Jun. He asks Kangriol if they have found the dungeon. He proudly says yes. A player is using his drone that is currently flying over the lot world. They are watching the footage on the screen. Xia Jun did not expect something like this to exist here. Xia Jun notices that the drone is going out of the lot world. But it is near the lot tower. Xia Jun is surprised to see it and asks the handler if they can get a closer view. He replies that they will lose connection. It is like another world. The dungeon shows a dungeon but they can see that it is not a normal one. They see an entrance which is just a rift like a black hole. Suddenly, the handler starts having a problem. Xia Jun asks him what is happening. He replies that the drone is not responding. It is crashing. 
Xia Jun asks if it is because of monsters. He replies no, they see a person's legs. Xia Jun asks him if he can pitch to their faces. The guy says he will just try to move the camera. Xia Jun recognizes them. It is the company. He wonders if they are the ones who summoned K. Byangu crushes that drone with his shoes. The handler is gloomy after losing his drone. Hana asks Xia Jun if it is possible that the company owns this dungeon. Xia Jun does not think so. He says that if they made this place, K should not have been summoned. But whatever it is, they have to stop it. They tell the captain about the whole situation. He is confused and asks who summoned whom and if they are saying K is summoned here. Xia Jun clears up the misunderstanding. Baingu wonders what kind of people they are who have spotted them. One subordinate asks him what that spittle gate is and if it is a dungeon. He replies he does not know. He says he has seen a lot of dungeons in his life, but never anything like this. He is pretty sure though that this is where the power of Bermuda District is hidden. He says that such an opportunity will never come again. He tells his men that if it is in the right hands it could be a weapon. He asks what they would do if more people like K showed up. One guy replies that there is no reason to be afraid of K. Bayangu says that they could blow up this place if they wanted to. Dungeon flowers make dungeons break. The company's job is to promote dungeon breaks by speeding up small dungeons with dungeon flowers. But they also explore these special dungeons and turn them into weapons. One such dungeon is running Ghost Train, a D-class dungeon that is a major achievement for Team Break 1. Bayangu says that if their plan works out, they can be promoted like the first team. They can also get a bonus. He raises their spirits and asks if they are ready to get the promotion. They show willingness. Suddenly, a bear mascot runs and enters the dungeon. They are surprised to see it. Bayangu asks him what they are waiting for. K will hit there soon, so they better hurry. All those men run and enter the gate. Siujun and others have left the hideout. They see the monsters as they come out. Siujun tells them to get ready and get this over with. He grabs his sword and kills those gigantic monsters with a few slashes. The captain and his men are awestruck to see his skills. Kangriel asks him if he is sure he does not want to look for the goblin orb. He replies that if was not sure that it is located in the dungeon, he would definitely look for it. A monster in the dungeon is probably the owner. If they attack the dungeon it will drop, and the orb will be ownerless. Hana asks what if the orb was spawned because of the dungeon break? If that is the case, when Siajun defeats it, the orb will not drop. Siajun says it is probably using the power of the dungeon as a conduit. Juung asks if that is even possible. He replies that he does not know. There is no point in asking such a question. Soul has become a game. Nothing is impossible now. As they go near the dungeon, they feel a strange energy. Siajun thinks that once they figure out this dungeon, they will not be able to solve only the orb question, but also the clone problem. He ponders that normally upon touching a dungeon, one would receive information about it. But there is nothing like that here. Yet it is strangely familiar. He decides to touch it a bit more. Suddenly, he sees a strange, dark thing flying around. He wonders what that is. It has a flower-like shape with teeth. The system warns them that an unknown force is stirring throughout the lot world. That monster rushes towards them to attack. Siajun slashes it away. With that, a new quest arrives. Suddenly, he disappeared from others' sight. They cannot see him even though he is there. The quest he gets is a quick call quest. He has to eliminate the parasites that have appeared in Lot World. If the conditions are met, Dungeon Puppeteer Pirates theme park will be created. He is asked to leave the Lot World and move where the dungeon call is taking place. And if he fails, he will die. He is stunned to know about a dungeon call. The ghost train arrives outside the Lot World. Captain Hansiok and others step out of the train. They thank Sangsu for the ride. He confidently replies that he is doing what he is getting paid to. Hansiok thinks that Sangsu is young, but he is amazing. He cannot believe that he took control of a D-class traveling dungeon and used it as a means of transportation. Kim Hoon calls the captain and says he will show them around. He lights the torch and takes them to the entrance to Lot World. Hansiok says that they are about to enter a place where they should not be. There are not many of them who played Dream Side 1. He asks them if they know what that means. Kim Hoon says that it means they do not have any experienced senior players. Hansiok says that is the reason they are needed here. Their memories of Dream Side are only what they have been through and what they have been able to cope with. Kim Hoon asks if the two supposedly out-of-towners had not gotten in. 
Hansyok asks if he is talking about Kay and Clark. Kim Hoon wonders if Clark is really the supreme god. Hansyok cannot believe that the number one idol is Clark. But if they are out of this world, this place is a first order disaster zone. He tells everyone to stay alert. As they reach the entrance, they find a blockage there. Kim Hoon says there was no mention of the underground being blocked. He says that it was definitely caved in before they got here. Hansiok says they cannot go above ground, so they decide to enter from the basement. But after entering, they see a disastrous thing. Hansiok asks what that thing is. Right after that, they see a dragon flying above their heads. The players are scared and wonder if the dragons are not S-class monsters. How can there be a dragon? Suddenly, that strange thing grabbed Jongseok by the feet and pulled him inside the ground. The ground closes after that. The others are afraid to see that. Hansiok thinks that it is parasitic water, like the ones that appeared during the The Dungeon Call in the tutorial. Kim Hoon is shocked to recall that elevator scene. Hansiok says that he has heard this place is going to be a dungeon, so they must leave the crying for later. They have to stop it, but wonder if there is a way. Those parasitic flowers are still attacking Siajun and others. He tells everyone to back off. He activates the freezing flash step skill and freezes that monster. As he steps on that monster, it freezes. Siajun thinks that the Bermuda district, all of those mysterious disappearances, and everything else were actually devoured by this thing. The entire Bermuda area has dungeons in progress. He slashes that monster and kills him into pieces with one swing. He thinks that players attack parasites in proportion to T number of monsters in Lot World. It must have been a sacrifice. He looks at the tower and says now he knows what is up there. That entrance is towards the seed room. He says that it takes a long time to fulfill the conditions for a dungeon call of this size. The process of turning into a dungeon will not be short, but they must hurry. They need to find the boss monster faster than the company guys. The captain is not familiar with the company. Siajun says that defeating the dungeon boss will cause the dungeon to stop naturally. It is the only way to stop the dungeon summoning. Kangriel says that it is even impossible for Kay to prevent a dungeon of this scale. He says they must fall back to the Ark and reorganize. Siagin says he cannot afford to do that. He is sure that the company guys will accelerate the dungeon call with the dungeon flower. They have to move forward. They must destroy the dungeon. Many parasitic monsters are waiting there for them as well. They keep dodging their attacks and killing them. Siajun freezes them and kills them. They reach the entrance. He tells everyone to get in. Jiyoung goes in first. Hana asks him what about him. He tells her to go first. After that, Kangriul and his men enter the gate. Siajun makes sure that no one is left behind. Meanwhile, another monster appears there. As he attacks him, he enters the dungeon, making a laugh of it. The system says that he has discovered the puppet master Pirat's secret seed room. The system confirms his possession of the goblin headpiece. It says that an unknown flow will lead him. He does not know what is happening. On the other side, Hana has entered there as well. She looks around and wonders if it is still not the lot world. She guesses they were spat randomly around the tower. Suddenly, she sees something coming from the other side. But when the vision clears, she finds it is like in coming this way. He asks her if she has seen the king. She replies Siajun must be here somewhere. Everything will be okay. They should search for them. He agrees. She asks him if he is not scared. He feels bad and says he is the great goblin. He is not scared of anything. She gets that he is like a child. Lycan tells her to walk slower. Suddenly, she remembered that they had never had a proper conversation. He says they can have it now. She says that he has told them that he was not always a monster and has suddenly regained his memory. He replies that it is right. He is a proud descendant of the Goblin Clan. She asks how he became a monster. It is her first time seeing a monster become an NPC. He replies he does not know. His memory fails him. She thinks that he feels like a kind of NPC guide. If they looked for the king's dignity, that would probably be a hidden quest. Suddenly, a wall falls in front of them. As the smoke clears, they see Kamushi fall there dead. After that, Kay appears there. She quickly activates her Bun Blood skill and aims for Kay. Siajun lands in a place where everything is white. He wonders where he is. Everything here, from the floor to the ceiling, is white like he is within drawing paper. There are no shadows too. It is a world where light rays do not exist. He knows now what it is. It is the game realm. Suddenly, he hears a voice saying that they have a precious guest. He is stunned. 
He prepares his weapon and turns around asking who he is. It is a guy. Siajun reads his name from the ID card hanging around his neck. He is no young Su. He forwards his hands and says it is a pleasure to see him. Siajun cannot understand a thing. Young Su says it would be better to show him this video first. A screen appears there, and a video plays there. It is a memory of Young Su. He tells him that October 2, 2021, was the first day he joined the company. He came to work with resolve to never feel down, even if the work was hard. But nothing went right, as expected. He ended up causing trouble because of his nerves. It was a rough day, to say the least. He was almost crying his way back home. Time passed, and the next day arrived. He went to work early that day. Actually, he did not need to do so, but it was his ambition to do well. Siajun interrupts him and asks if that is the daydream side opened. He replies yes. He continues his story. He entered Lot World at 6 a.m. that day. Inside he met the dungeon boss, Pirit. Uncertain about what was going on, all the while being so scared that he could not move. Death came for him the very next moment. He thought he would just be late again that day, yet instead, he was to die in vain. However, for some reason, Pirit used that crystal ball and brought him back to life. He was a puppet whose memories were forfeited and whose emotions were lost due to Pirit's curse. Pirit handed him the treasure which reclaimed him. Then, he disappeared. After that, those who entered without knowing anything ended up at the night opening. The fear and the trauma embedded in his mind soon manifest as a monster chasing survivors night after night. The real tragedy struck after the survivors figured out the cause. Then, new monsters appeared when new people arrived and the night opening would begin again. Whenever a newcomer showed up, their life was then taken by nightfall. Siajun thinks that the problem is that the survivor also ended up dead. He asks Young Su why he is showing him this. He replies that maybe it is that he does not want to be forgotten, or maybe it is his desire to prove that it was not his fault. Siajun asks what that means. He replies that he does not know the details either. These are just the thoughts of the former new employee Young Su. He asks if he remembers the mascot. Siajun shockingly asks if he is the bear mascot. He says it was he who attacked them at Lot World and fled with the orb. He replies that it is half right and half wrong. The bear mascot he met was not entirely him. They were just cogwheels crafted to make the Lot World return to its full potential. Siajun asks if he is saying that all the mascots are being controlled by someone. He replies precisely. Amongst them, he is the only one who possesses the true thoughts of Young Su. He came to his senses after this place started to look as it does now. As he wandered Lot World, he gradually began to understand the situation. He died and then was resurrected. Yet, he is but a thought, and even those thoughts are tied to the orb. He is unable to do anything. What he remembers after being isolated is that he ran around trying to save people, even that failed. But he was able to figure out why this place had a strange form where day and night were distinct. Pirate is a harsh narrator. Young Su thinks he enjoys watching the happy days, especially the moments that lead them to horror-filled nights and tragedy. In other words, it is his bad hobby. It brings him joy to see people make extreme choices when struggling in pain. Young Su could feel what he felt, he was ever horrified by it. He went through that pain. It wasn't until two months later that he came to his senses. He asks Siajun if he is K. Siajun asks him if he knows him. He says yes. He too was a player of Dream Side 1, even though G did not receive any payment for subjugation. Suddenly, Young Su starts disappearing. He tells Siajun that he does not have enough time. Escaping the shackles of Pirate means giving up even a thought. There is something K needs to do because only he can accomplish it. He already has the goblin headpiece in his possession, so only he can do this. He gives a goblin orb to Siajun. The system gives him the title of Goblin King and says he has the king's imprint ability. Young Su requests him to become the owner of the Goblin Orb first. That way he can bring out his true strength. To confront Pirit, he must fully control the Goblin Orb. While fighting him, he must not close his eyes and breathe. Finally, he must prepare for Dream Side 2. Siajun asks him what he means by that. Young Su tells him to beware of the regular updates conducted each year. According to the information he took out from Pirate, K is the one in the most peril. Young Su disappears completely. She shoots a bullet at him. She also warns Lycan to stay away from here. K bends and dodges her attack. He swings his sword at her, but she escapes. He takes his daggers out and throws them at her. 
she activates her eagle's eyes skill to observe the dagger's movements closely and dodges them accordingly. K does not stop there. He creates a fireball. She can feel the heat before he throws it at her. But she escapes that attack as well. She thinks that no one found out what K's job was until the end. But fortunately, he is different from the Siajun. He does not seem normal. She asks him if he is difficult to defeat. She does not think so. She activates the grain bullet skill and shoots them at him. But instead of hitting him, the bullets go to the roof and create holes there. The light makes things difficult for him. She uses magic bullet bombardment, but he blocks them with his sword. She wonders if he is not stronger than Siajun. But then she neglects her thinking, saying he is a monster. He might have Kay's skills and sense, yet he is a brainless monster. As he launches his next attack, she snaps and tells him to disappear already. As he reaches the point where those bullets pierce the roof, the roof starts crumbling. She uses the explosive bomb skill and it makes the roof fall on Kay's head. The floor also breaks and he falls. She peeks at him and says he has become a complete monster. Hana calls Lycan to come out. He appears from behind a pillar and starts walking beside her. She wonders if Siajun will be okay. Kangriol's comrades are running in Lot Tower's corridor, wondering why Kay is chasing them. They see their captain and ask him if Kay is not their friend anymore. He asks them if that guy looks like Kay to them. That comrade says that Kay fought Kamushi. Kangriol tells him Kay got Kamushi and all the monsters in Lot World. That is why he is starting to chase after the players. That comrade notices something in the 12 o'clock direction and tells the captain to look there. They see someone there. She shoots and hits someone behind that comrade. When he looks at her gun, he recognizes she is Choi Hana. He is glad to see her. She asks them if she is late. Inside that white room, Siajun starts the process of imprinting. He is ready to become the owner of the goblin orb. He cuts his palm and drops the blood on that orb. As the blood drops, an illuminating light emerges from the orb. It is almost blinding him. The system confirms him as Goblin King. It starts the king's imprint, which will be completed soon. Due to this, the orb regains its true form. It shifts in the form of a ring. It tells him that the Goblin King's ring can materialize spirits. Now Siajun can see why Lycan said that the Goblin Orb must be acquired to increase one's regality. The system confirms him as the Goblin King and his imprint is also done. With that, the Goblin King has regained his true form. He has also mastered the Goblin King's senses. He obtains the skill of Mortuary. With that, he can peer into the souls of others, distinguish between good and evil souls, and bring people back. After all, the cause was the Goblin Orb. He gets that the crowds and monsters in Lot World were reborn by this orb. People like Mr. Young Su were reborn as monsters. They were killing monsters that were not even monsters. And the souls of the people who came here eventually produced more monsters. There is another factor that terrorizes him. It is the dungeon boss, Pirit. Siajun says that basically the goblin orb materialized those people's souls and created this dungeon all alone. Siajun notices that the white room has started collapsing. He wonders if it is due to the disappearance of Yang Su. But it is okay, as the gate has already opened. The system informs him that he is now entering the puppeteer Pirit's secret seed room. Inside Lot Cinema, some players are lying injured on the seats. One guy is trying to aim for K. He is shivering and thinks there is no way he can beat K. K is rushing towards him. Suddenly, Siajun appeared there and blocked K's attack. Kyo counterattacks. While dodging, Siajun wonders if Mr. Mung Young Su wanted him to be here. He hears Hana's voice. She is fighting another version of K. She tells him to hang in there as she will help him after finishing this. Lycan is with her. He looks at Siajun and asks if he is their real king. Siajun looks at his copy and says that this one is from the past, the time of Dream Side 1 when he was level 200 and his mind was set on killing solely. It looks like this copy is still the same. Siajun does not need to run from the battle. He knows all his weaknesses. They both rush toward each other carrying their swords. Siajun looks at his sword and remembers that it is a sword he used to compensate for his lack of offensive power. It is a weapon with quite a few weaknesses. He is escaping and blocking Kay's attack and says that one of the weaknesses of that sword is that it is short and rigid too. Siajun kicks his face and pushes him back. Then he runs towards him thinking that at that time, he gave up one piece of equipment to increase his swing speed. He attacks his knees and slashes them. The target is hit accurately. 
Siyajun thinks that he is more experienced now than back then because of what he has lived up till now. After that, Siyajun beheads K and ends his scene. He looks at Hana, who is aiming for the second K. He takes the opportunity and stabs him from behind. She thanks Siyajun. Lycan and Ji Young seem glad to see him again. He asks if everyone is okay. She replies they are, thanks to him. He tells them to get ready. Suddenly, the roof of the cinema starts crumbling. They wonder if that is another Kamushi. He tells them that it is not Kamushi. It is the final boss of this place. He is Puppeteer Pirate. That monster laughs and asks Yejun how he dared to take his orb. He keeps laughing hysterically and asks how dare he lay hands on the king's possessions. His voice is so noisy that it hurts everyone's ears. He tells them they will not even be used as a dungeon sacrifice. Siyajun thinks that his speaking skills are even better than those of D-rank bosses. It is a monster born with intelligence. ji asks why, all of a sudden, a boss monster has appeared and if Siyajun has not finished the quest yet. He replies that something unexpected has happened. He says that the goblin orb can materialize, but it only materializes. It does not give one absolute control. Of course, those souls swear allegiance to their creator, but even that cannot control them all if they become too numerous. Only the king has full control. Siyajun activates the Dragon Eye skill. He finds that this strange power flowing around is Magi. Magi is a magic power used by demons and devils. Only creatures of the demonic realm can use it. Among them, beings with intelligence are called Magic. So, this boss monster is a demonic monster of level 300 or higher. Siyajun asks him if he is a demon. He does not reply and says he invites him to die by his hands. He throws a card on the floor. Siyajun tells his friends to stay calm. As the card hits the floor, darkness takes over. The system informs that the monster has declared its territory and they have entered his territory. Siyajun observes fog all around. He feels someone is approaching him, but he dodges the attack. He thinks Young Su might be talking about this. The dense magic emanating from Puppeter covers the space and obstructs his vision. He tries to activate his Dragon Eye skill, but it has been neutralized due to the monster's offensive skills. Suddenly, Kangriul's men launch an attack on him. He blocks it. He blocks that guy away and realizes that fog is taking over their minds. Hana tells everyone to hold their breath and close their eyes. The monster asks him to return his orb. Those troop members surround Siyajun. They are attacking him, but he keeps escaping. He hits their heads to bring their senses back. They fall unconscious but they get up again. Siyajun realizes that it will never end this way. Magi starts affecting him too, but his calmness skill protects him temporarily. He cannot stay here long enough. Otherwise, he will become Pirate's puppet as well. He needs to defeat him before the Magi takes him over. He activates his new spiritual senses skill. He finds the monster's location. He activates the particular imagination skill. This can manipulate spirits. The number of spirits used determines the amount of power. Ultimately, he activates the goblin's fire skill for the goblin king's minion. With that fire, he burns the magic effect on those comrades. Now he can feel the real power of the orb. The monster laughs and says it is funny to see how humans struggle. Yet, they will end up his puppet anyway. He says that Siyajun has tremendous courage, so he will make him the coolest puppet ever. He shoots beams at him, which Siyajun blocks with his sword. As he runs towards him, the monster creates a spider web to stop him. Siyajun is in a fix and says that at this rate, all players here will be wiped out. That is what the monster wants. Suddenly, Lycan cuts that web and tells his king to march forward. Siyajun observes that Lycan is huge again due to the effect of the orb. Siyajun says that he has had enough of that old repertoire. He draws the spirits around his sword and beheads that monster with his sword. He tells him that this is called karma. The system announces that he has defeated the boss monster and has found the hidden ending. The park has failed to dungeonize as well. Suddenly, the system gives the opposite message and says the dungeon has been completed. Kangriel asks Siyajun what is happening here. Those players wake up from an unconscious state. When they look at the dead bodies, they cannot believe that they killed their fellows. Siyajun thinks that those affected by the demonic energy become madmen, as the energy contaminates the brain itself. They will not remember bringing harm to their comrades. Rather, they only know the result. Kangriol shoes his comrade and tells him to pull himself together as the fight has not ended yet. He tells everyone not to fall apart. People who are alive should be the priority when getting out. 
The captain asks Siajin if the boss monster's death is confirmed. He replies that he has gained experience points from it. He has also acquired the title of the Truth Explorer. Hana calls him and tells him to come this way. He is shocked to see outside the window. The whole city has disappeared. The captain asks him what is happening. Siajun recalls that two contrasting messages appeared simultaneously. Other than Lot World and the Tower, it looks like a glitch-free empty scene. This feels just like that situation in Dream Side 1. He tells others that they are isolated. He looks in the mirror and says it is not just darkness, but truly a space of absolute nothingness. Kangriel asks what that means. Siajun asks Choi Hana, what if the dungeon completes the moment the boss dies and what she would do about it? She wonders if it is possible. He replies that it is possible. Though a rare case, it did happen in Dream Side 1. Kangriel asked if that was about the first refund incident. Siajun replies it is just like that. This place is a dungeon without a boss. First refund incident, just before the dungeonization in Dream Side 1, when the boss monster was defeated. A bug occurred coincidentally as the dungeon was completed. A player referred to it as a lost dungeon. Trapped in this lost dungeon, they were immediately kicked out and could never log back in. There was only one outcome back then. It was an exit-less dungeon. It is a dungeon one can never escape from. In front of Lot World, Hansiok and his team are fighting those monsters. He clenches his teeth and thinks if they are the support team, they are all newbies without any real experience. Entering blind is risky for them. Suddenly, he observes that parasite activities have quieted down a bit. He wonders if the situation has stabilized. His team tells him that it is time to go. He orders them to get ready to enter and search for survivors before the dungeonization completes. He tells them to hurry. They have to rescue Clark and Kay. Without them, Ark would have no hope. Suddenly, they feel an earthquake, and the earth starts tearing apart. Hansiok tells everyone to get out of there. They see the things getting inside the earth. Hansiok stands on the bank and wonders what is happening there. He asks if it is a sinkhole. His comrade tells him that they cannot contact anyone. There is no response from anyone. He lifts a rock and throws it inside. It strikes with a shield. After that, the barrier appears visibly. That guy asks the captain if the otters are inside. Hansiok has been notified that a bug has occurred, and it is currently undergoing system recovery. Hansiok cannot believe that bugs occur in this world as well. He orders his men to contact Ark at once. They need to find instances of dungeonization bugs in Dream Side 1 and find a way out of this situation. He says that they must surely still be alive. Two days have passed in isolation. They regained some composure and thoroughly searched the now-served Lot world. Finding an exit was their priority, whether underground or at the top of the tower, but they found nothing remarkable. Kangriel comes to see Ajun and tells him that cell phones are out of service here. Apart from Lot world and the tower, the area is all restricted. Siajun punches that barrier and wonders if they are completely isolated. Kangriel says that he has read about losing many accounts in the Lost Dungeon during Phase 1. Even with three lives left, they could not log in. One guy asks if it means they are toast. Siajun replies they are not. It seems their current approach might be wrong. There is one difference from back in Dream Side 1. Then it was an error of not being able to log in after being kicked. But for them it is not logging in but the inability to log out themselves. Kangrel requests him to elaborate on the situation. He says that they are trying to create a dungeon break. 